Where did, wow, what a different view you have. Good morning. For the record, uh, Chris Cole, Commissioner of Buildings and General Services. Thank you for the invitation to come and testify on electric vehicles. I believe that's why I'm here. Yes. Yep. And um, I'm going to let, um, so I'd like to introduce Harmon Wilder, who is the fleet manager for the state of Vermont. What was the first name? Harmony. Harmony. Oh, Harmony. Oh, somebody said you need to talk Harmony. Yes. <laughs> Which is why I'm going to take up very little of your time and uh, allow Harmony to be in the seat because she can get into the real nuts and bolts of um, how we are planning to expend this uh, $500,000 for further electrifying the state fleet. Um, as you know, this is an important uh, investment for the state of Vermont. We haven't had an investment like this uh, for quite a while uh, to really uh, jumpstart the electric vehicles. These are not the only funds we will be, <coughs> excuse me, expending on electric vehicles. So the normal <coughs> process of purchasing electric vehicles, uh, we have two types of vehicles in the state fleet. We have motor pool, which is a pod of vehicles that state employees can um, use for business-related trips. Um, different departments and different agencies can use a motor pool. It is the most efficient use of vehicles. Then we have fleet vehicles that are assigned to departments and agencies. And, and those vehicles are assigned based upon the number of miles um, a department needs to use the vehicles. And right now, I believe the number is 11,000. But it depends on the special use. There may right. be a special use that demands a vehicle. If you're less than that, you, there may, as Harmony said, be special considerations. But just on a cost basis, it's cheaper for the state of Vermont to assign a vehicle to a state employee when they're regularly going to drive 11,000 miles or more in a year. Sometimes for safety considerations or the nature of their work, they'll get a fleet vehicle assigned to them whether they reach that 11,000 or not because of the programmatic needs of what they're using the vehicle for. We're going to focus on the motor pool, and part of this uh, program is, is going to do two things. One, it's going to dramatically decrease uh, the cost to the state of Vermont in terms of fuel usage uh, using the EVs. Um, two, it's also going to expose state employees to electric vehicles that they don't own themselves, thereby lessening some of that EV anxiety or range anxiety that people may have when changing different technologies. So we see uh, dual benefits from, um, from this. The other way we're going to introduce EVs into the program is through Harmony's regular uh, purchasing power in how we purchase EVs um, currently. And this program is set up with an internal service fund, so it's a fleet fund. Um, it has a positive balance in it, uh, but the uh, liabilities we owe the treasurer, so the way fleet program works, we borrow money for the treasurer, we purchase the vehicle, we charge the departments and agencies a rate for the use of that vehicle, and then we're paying off um, the treasurer over time. And eventually, we sell these vehicles, um, and so Harmony um, is one of our top managers at BGS. She runs a performance-based program. She has all kinds of data. When I arrived five years ago, she presented me with a five-point plan on how to increase the efficiency of the fleet pipeline program, which uh, we have been working on uh, since then. But one of the things uh, that she's changed is we have telematics on the vehicle, which is a a data gathering system so we know how many miles the vehicle has been driven. We know the fuel economy of the vehicle. We know where the vehicle has gone. We know underutilized vehicles that are a waste of taxpayer money if they're not being used to that 11,000 miles. And so we're actively managing the fleet to generate savings for the state of Vermont. And the way the fleet program generates savings is we provide the employees mobility. They either use their own car charge a rate 
or we provide them a vehicle. Our decision making is what is the lowest cost to provide state employees with this mobility. And so for some departments, when they have high mileage drivers, meaning they're getting reimbursements at a higher rate, and we would have saved money with a fleet vehicle, we're constantly in communication and sending them notifications of uh, those reimbursements. And on the other side of the coin, when we have a fleet vehicle that's assigned to a department that's only getting 3,000 miles of travel in a year, we eventually will take that vehicle back unless they change how it's operated because it's not the best value for the state. So we're not always um, we're not always the most welcome in these conversations with other state agencies and departments and pointing out the data-driven reality of the use of these vehicles. But um, I am in charge of making the hard decisions and pulling vehicles away from departments when they're not being effectively utilized as they were intended. So with that overview, I think I will turn it over to Harmony, who will get right into the deployment of this $500,000. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. For the record, my name is Harmony Wilder, and I'm the fleet manager for the BGS Centralized Fleet. So I tried to anticipate some of your questions today, so I have my own little cheat sheets here. Um, as we deploy these vehicles, we're really focused on sedans because as of right now, those are the EV vehicles that are available. So we really drilled down into our sedans. Um, we looked at least the assigned vehicles and we looked at the motor pool. Um, we have complete control over the motor pool. So we can decide what vehicles are gonna fit in what location. Um, the, the assigned vehicles, we work closely with the department, um, but they do help make that decision by providing us the data that we then review and, and provide them with the vehicle that we think best meets their programmatic need. But the motor pool we have complete and total control over. Um, they're typically typically used for short-term travel. So if an employee needs to go to a meeting or a client visit, site visit, that kind of thing. Um, the, the assigned vehicles are more um, to meet a programmatic need. So whether that is transporting a ward of the state or inspecting a farm or things like that, those it's a programmatic need typically that we would look to assign vehicles. The way our program works now, we have a motor we have motor pools available at eight different locations. Um, however, only five cities or towns are represented in those eight locations. So for example, Montpelier has three locations. Seems kind of unfair, but that's actually where the highest um, travel is originating from. So we look at mileage reimbursement and we say, okay, where, where are people leaving from? What are the, what's the originating travel? And we so said that's where the motor pools need to be. Um, so then we, once we designate an area for a motor pool, um, we put vehicles there and then we allow them to reserve them and, and use them from those locations. We would like, we are interested to expand into other areas. Um, some of the some of the considerations that we look at are we need a partner um, so we're looking to agencies and departments to partner to hand out the keys so up front I'm looking for a partner um, I'm also looking for parking spaces I'm looking for a vendor to help us maintain that vehicle to repair the vehicle I can't I don't have staff in Brattleboro or Brennan Benning so I've got to find a lot of partners um, sometimes that can be challenging um, part of our, our plan that I presented to Commissioner Cole when he arrived is um, developing an automated motor pool. So it would be similar to like a hotel reservation. Um, it would have a key kiosk. So you would go up and you would either swipe your badge or you'd have a pin and it would present you with the key. So take away that face-to-face. -face. Um, it would allow them to reserve the vehicle at their leisure, not during business hours, um, and as well as pick up the vehicle after hours if they needed to leave for a meeting before you know, our office opens, then they would be able to do that. So that's part of the plan. Um, introducing electric vehicles. So we have currently 27 plug-in hybrid electric vehicles in our motor pool. Um, well, 25 in our motor pool, two we lease to agency of transportation as an assigned vehicle. And those are fully electric, the two that VTrans has leased. They've been a great partner with us. Um, they're, um, Leasing it to, a, to an agency or department requires that they really manage it closely and make sure that folks are educated and know the, the limits of the vehicle as well as when they should be using it and ensuring that it gets used. Uh, so the, then the 25 vehicles that we have that are plug-in hybrid in the motor pool, um, we have them located in Waterbury, 
Burlington at the 108 Cherry Street parking garage and in Montpelier um, at Green Mountain Power Drive, which is where our office is located. Um, they are, um, we have a one-to-one -one ratio of charging stations. So when they return at night, they plug in and then um, they're always insured the, the parking space and the charging station. As we get going, that may not always be required. Certainly for the full electric vehicles, we would look for a one-to-one, -one, but maybe with the hybrids, we wouldn't always need a one-to-one, -one, but that's where we're starting. Um, so the fleet management program purchased those charging stations, paid for the installation of those charging stations, and we were able to do that without additional funding up front because we looked at our motor pool rate, which is currently um, 40 cents a mile. and. So there's, a, there's also a minimum charge. So if you use it for four hours or less, it's a minimum of $20. So if you tra travel less than 50 miles, you're paying a little bit more than 40 cents, but 40 cents is, is the standard rate. If you go, you know, you get 100 free miles and then every mile after that's 40 cents. So we looked at our rates and we said, okay, we have some, yes, absolutely. That's what you charge. Agencies and departments. Yeah. Um, so we looked at those rates and we said, okay, we have some room. We can either lower our rates or we can use the, fund, the additional um, cushion there to start purchasing the electric vehicles and in that infrastructure that's, that's required for that. Um, so we did that in um, Waterbury, Burlington and Montpelier and um, we purchased the 25 electric vehicles. Without raising our rates, we were kind of at a point where um, it was gonna be like one at a time. Um, and of course, installing one charging station um, isn't as cost effective as installing a bank of charging stations. Um, so we were really kind of waiting it out until um, we were received word that we may receive $500,000 and that'll allow us to really start moving again um, to deploy these electric vehicles. And with the 500,000, we think that we can purchase um, 12 fully electric vehicles. That would be our goal is fully electric vehicles. Um, and charging stations, which actually more more than what we need because from our own funds, we would purchase some plug-in hybrid electric vehicles to go along with that. And we would be looking to expand to Rutland. Um, we would like some charging stations and motor pool electric vehicles in Rutland, one in Springfield and Barrie, ide uh, ideally Barrie, just by kind of looking at the, again, the travel that's happening. And we know some there's gonna be some shifting of departments. We think that we could support some motor pool vehicles there. Do you have questions or? Yes, but well, were you finished? I, I think I am, and I think I'm hopefully prepared for some of your questions. Yes. Can I yes. ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you thinking about offering a different rate? For oh, the yes, fully absolutely. So the funding that we receive, of course, how our rates are, are calculated now is we take the depreciation of the vehicle, the anticipated depreciation, um, our projected maintenance and repair, um, our program administration fee, and we take that and make it into a, a rate which is 40 cents a mile. Since we won't have to pay for the vehicles, we're gonna use this outside funding, we're gonna remove the depreciation from our rate and it's going to allow us to charge, we think about 16 cents a mile. So we really think that's, that'll, that'll be some incentive for agencies and departments to- So depreciation is a major part. The depreciation is a major part of our rate. Okay, Mary, Barbara, and Pence. Have you chosen what a fully electric vehicle Purchase. We have gone up, we will have to go out to bid, so I'll make that clear. It really hinges on which manufacturers bid. So while I would, I have a list of the vehicles that we would like to bid, I can't guarantee that they will. Um, we think for the electric vehicle that the Bolt is going to make the most sense or the, um, the Leaf S Plus. Um, so either of those two, if you look at the range, so what we did was we took the MSRP, we divided it by the range, and we got a, a cost per mile, and we thought that one of those two vehicles would work. Hyundai um, has never bid before on a state contract, so they have some great vehicles offered, but they have never bid, so I don't have a lot of hope that we would get that participation. I know you folks are coming over to see us at our office next week, and I've asked if Hyundai will be present, and we're not sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we're not sure if Hyundai will come, but um, if they do, I plan to say, let's please bid, because um, the more bids we get, the more competition, the better the prices for the vehicle, we think, more options we have. But for electric, we're hoping for the Bolt. 
the vault was on contract before, so I'm pretty sure we'll get a bid for that. We're also hoping that the lower rate that's provided to departments for an EV compared to a fossil fuel vehicle being as cash strapped as most departments are, that, that they will opt to uh, send their employees to electric vehicles rather than And it will also be lower than the reduced mileage rate that employees can currently receive to take their own vehicle. So if they elect not to take a state vehicle that's available right now, they can accept that reduced rate, which is 18 cents a mile. So if I can offer a vehicle for less than that, then agencies and departments may be inclined to say, no, you're still not going to take the reduced rate. You're, we have a, a, a more economical option for you. So. Well, I appreciate that you've spoken to the economical options of, of why you would, you know, not consider the depreciation rate. But I am concerned that the, this makes that makes this a one-time investment. That that these will depreciate. They will need to be replaced, and you now have not funded their replacement. Um, so, well, Would you explain yes, how the regular. Right. So, when I go to replace a vehicle, I have to replace the vehicle. Um, right. So I would. I'm hoping, you know, we keep the vehicle six years, sometimes a little longer. If, um, if it hasn't reached 80 to 90,000 miles, it might stay on the fleet a little longer. I expect the range of these vehicles to really increase in six to seven years. They have already. When we were purchasing these vehicles back in 2012, I was getting a Prius hybrid that got 12 mile electric range. And now I'm looking at, uh, you know, an all electric vehicle that's getting 151. So in seven more years, I think that the I think you're going to see the cost um, come in line with the with the combustible gas engine vehicles, and then it will be economical. Then the we take away. Right. I don't think that really answers my question though, because what I was saying is that you're spending five hundred thousand buying vehicles, yep. and you're not going to, as you charge them out, think about that five hundred thousand dollar replacement value. So if we, you're not considering a depreciation of the vehicle. So we we actually buy the vehicle first. So right. we don't collect money to buy a vehicle. We, we buy a vehicle, then we collect the money for it. So that comes after. So if I buy a vehicle for the motor pool, I haven't I haven't pre-collected any money even as it stands today. So if I decide a new, yep, go ahead. No, go ahead. So if I decide a, an employee is driving more than 11,000 miles, I've not taken into consideration any, any depreciation. I've not saved for that. I borrow the money from the treasurer and then I collect a rate which will allow me to pay off that vehicle. So we can still do this with the way the regular fleet program works. We're looking at this half a million dollars of one-time money. Exactly, this is, that's what I'm This is right. one-time money, this is not right. base money. Right. We're looking at it as an opportunity to, to really get a slug of vehicles and charging stations at one time, which we otherwise would not be able to do. Right. And then we're going to incentivize the use of these vehicles. So one of the hurdles that we have to overcome is humans right. and their dislike of change yeah. and dislike of things new and technology. So we're working against humans to, to bring them mm -hmm. on board. And so right. this is something that we deal with every day. And to incentivize, so just as the governor recommended an incentive payment to get the private citizens to purchase EVs, we need to incentivize state employees to use these vehicles through offering a lower rate through their departments. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of using this one-time money. In the regular program, the EV would have the depreciation schedule, and, and there is no incentive for its use. So. Yeah. That's that's part of the brilliance of yeah. the program for us in that we have to get a carrot out there just like right. you have to in the private sector to get state employees to make the change to learn, you know, the five to ten minutes at what the operating differences are. I, I think that that's just what I was trying to really clarify is that it is a one time jump right. rather than enhance it's not altering a portion that you would normally be buying. It it is an additional but I would be buying shot. the vehicles anyway. I just wouldn't be buying. So, so these vehicles that right. I'll be taking in the twelve are going to replace existing gas vehicles. So right. I'm really saving. I already have the money tucked away to buy those vehicles. And so you don't. Yeah. So I don't have to spend that money so today. Sure they, yes. That's still there. Yeah. So well, I just the, certainly the charging stations are an investment. Those, That's those are an investment. And, yeah. and the charging stations are the real constraint to program. Right. Yeah. Because 
in order to expand the number of electric vehicles in the fleet as a percentage of the fleet, yeah. you have to first invest in the charging stations. And I guess I would just take one more second and say, I'd like put a plug in for the fact that there's a lot of Vermont north of Burlington. <laughs> and St. Albans has both a state office building that's attached to a very large garage that the state made a whole bunch of investment in. So it might be worth looking at least as far north as St. Albans. Yeah. So Harmony looks at all I, I the locations, yeah. and we make decisions yeah. based upon it is new, so the return on right investment there. to the state of Vermont. This is yeah. a data-driven decision-making process. Yeah. Where are we going to get the most value for deploying vehicles? And eventually, when we have um, enough vehicles in the fleet that are EV or plug-in hybrid, you will certainly see. I would suggest Saint that if these are intended to get people to use them. St. Albans might be a great place to start because you're trying to get someone who's looking at a longer commute to think about EV and to think of it as practical and think of it as functional. And so if that really is the intent to use these to jumpstart the recalcitrant population, you might want to start in St. Albans rather than in Barry or Montpelier where everybody's using them anyway because you're here. Okay. I want to thank you for that answer, but nevertheless, I want to suggest that you remove the one that's in Burlington. Only. Yes, you are. I'll put in a plug for something south of Montpelier <laughs> because you have nothing south of Montpelier, and there's a whole heck of a lot of the state south of Montpelier who drives a heck of a longer distance to get to Montpelier in Burlington. I'll say that. But, yeah, so, so what can we talk about? The heck of St. Albans, Rutland, Bennington, Rutland, Rutland, Rutland and Benning, so, uh, Springfield would be the okay. two. So, um, and speaking of the st charging stations, where are you suggesting they go and how many are being installed with this money? So, well, I don't, I'm, know I don't want to, I, probably not. Okay. I'm, I'm hesitant to commit yet because we really need to do a cost analysis and I, and without knowing how much these are going to cost to install, um, I can't commit completely. I would like to do the Rutland parking garage and I want to say we can be throughout um, Rutland two dual, dual port so they will charge four vehicles um, and Springfield one dual port, Barry one dual port. And six dual ports in Montpelier at 134 State Street, as they do not have any currently. Um, and these decisions were this is the first initial screen, right. just based upon based uh, purely driving on data. data. Yeah. What we haven't screened yet are um, the electrical capacity. Uh, capacity. capacity for the particular yeah. building, what kind of power are they bringing, um, how easy it, is it to bring that power to the preferred location, are there is there a ledge? Are there environmental issues? I mean, once you start digging into the dirt, you start coming up with a whole other range of issues. And so uh, since we have limited funding, we're going to prioritize the charging stations that don't present the most challenges. Well, that just gives us a ballpark. Just yes. So yeah. that's what I presented to my commissioner and said, we please put your project votes on this and, and get me back some of the Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, um, so there were a couple of things I just wanted to clarify, which is that the, um, we, I think we're getting a, a little confused on the committee with some of the questions around what the vehicles are actually used for in the fleet today. Because um, I think that idea of like using them for commutes, my impression was that that's not what's happening. And I heard that in one of the comments from my colleagues here. Just wanted to clarify that. And I also wanted just to ask um, when um, Chris was talking about the, the kind of hump you have to get over with changing the behavior of the folks driving. Um, you know, I happen and Becca happened to work at a company that has been transitioning our fleet over to EVs. Um, and like almost to a person, people are like, they're more fun to drive, this is better. Once they kind of get over understanding range, understanding where they can plug in. So do you, is it your impression that there's just kind of a hump of changing habits, learning the vehicles, and that they'll basically be as good or better to drive for people after? Would that be a fair assessment of what you'd expect? It's really about education and exposure. So we even found with the plug-in hybrid vehicles that there was fear. Um, you know, they don't understand that it switches over to gas, that some of them thought they were fully electric already. So what we did was we took our reservation form and we modified it to say, is this your first time ever driving an electric vehicle? And if they answered yes, we sent someone out with them who 
the vehicle and said, this is how you unplug it, this is how you plug it in, no, you won't get electrocuted if it's raining, all of these <laughs> questions that they have yeah. that are, that are um, serious concerns that they have, um, we are able to answer that and we know who it is that hasn't used them before. So that's really, yeah, it's education. And, and, um, and then the first few times they use it, you're right, they come back. Some of the, our customers that were hesitant now specifically request them. They are more fun to drive, they're quiet, comfortable they're higher quality I mean they have heated seats I mean some of them love the heated seats so I do feel like it's really education and it's a great opportunity for the state because we are exposing potential consumers in their private lives um, about EVs as being an employer that is diversifying their fleet and if I could follow yes. one thing um, the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is I think we've been in the committee as we've been talking about EVs a little stuck in the mode of thinking about charging like you think about stopping at the gas station on the way to and from places um, and our experience with electric vehicles shows us that consumer behavior is a little different as the range increases you know I could see someone taking out a fleet vehicle in Montpelier to go and do something in Brattleboro and coming all the way back on one charge um, pretty easily, you know, that'd be about a 240 mile round trip. Um, and you could do that in a bolt on if you weren't, you know, doing a bolt EV and if you weren't, um, you know, using the heat uh, in the dead of the winter. So I'm wondering, um, you know, what the, if you could give us a sense of if there's a limitation with the charging infrastructure that does exist today of us rolling out more of an electric fleet um, other than just at the main places where you do need charging that the that it's not really the charging out in the world that's the limit it's the when the when we need to fill up the batteries at home right the vehicles are parked and it's a it's a little challenging even to get our drivers to plug in um, if there's one nearby um, so even if they know there's one two blocks down the street we honestly don't think that they're going to plug in so we have, we're going to try to encourage them to stay within that range um, for two reasons. One, because we can't guarantee that they'll plug in. And they, if they're passive aggressive, they're going to run out of charge. Um, and two, we, don't, we want it to be successful. We want them to have a great experience because the news, bad news travels much faster than good news. So if we can have, make sure everyone has a really great experience, they're telling their family and friends that it wasn't so bad. And um, we're exposing thousands of state employees. We have the potential to really expose thousands of state employees to this new technology and, and make sure that they have an experience. Um, so we're going to be conservative with the range and the trips that we, that's another positive to the motor pools. We can match their trips. So when they reserve the vehicle, they tell us where they're going. Now we know which ones to give this vehicle to versus this vehicle to. So that's really helpful. Um, whereas when we assign it to a department, we have to rely on them to make those decisions. Um, whereas we, we're the go-between, so we get to make those decisions and make sure that they have that great experience, make sure we go outside with them and take <coughs> them the vehicle. So that's, you know, it's not just about cost savings, it's, it's really also about um, providing a really good experience to the drivers. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much. And it's very uh, encouraging uh, and impressive what you guys are doing. Um, but Harmony, the reason uh, at least that I wanted you guys to, to come and talk to us was uh, uh, because we had heard from the uh, auto manufacturers, um, and everybody calls it the California Compact, but I know it's not a compact, it's the uh, California state, and a lot of good things, the one of 13 states that do that, you probably know about this. And so they need to be required to sell uh, increasing of electric vehicles. And so we thought that you know, the state's a good place to to help with those sales, you know, make those sales. Um, so um, looking into the future, from Barbara's point, when we don't have this one time shot. And by the way, the 500,000, is that Volkswagen money? Uh, I don't know. No, it's just okay. this is general fund one time. All right. It's just, Revenues you, you've just been told it's one time. Revenues that exceeded projections from FY19. Okay. So not FY20 money, it's current fiscal year money that, or 18 money, I think. It exceeded projections or it's money that wasn't accounted for. Yeah, yeah surplus. Yeah, uh, not based on. Right. 
and it's accumulated it's, surplus. Right. So for a couple of it isn't years. the only money we will be spending on electric vehicles. Well, this uh, my question is, um, uh, shouldn't we have a, a, a goal or goals or a, a policy of phasing in electric vehicles um, and at an expedited rate? Uh, or, so that's one, kind of one question. Let me get the two. Second question would be, tell me why we couldn't just have a policy that, that says something like this. Um, whenever we're purchasing a, a vehicle, um, we will purchase an electric vehicle if, it, if it's practical. By practical, I mean uh, you know, the distance is how many you need that go the, you know, within the range of the electric cars. And um, uh, well, that's, that's the question. Okay. Why, why not have a policy that actually does that? Well, I think you already do. The, the policy is that you purchase the most fuel efficient vehicle on contract that's cost competitive. Right? So that's already a policy. Um, and when we say cost competitive, are we uh, life cycle cost? Yeah, life cycle Great. cost. Um, so we already do. Um, we need to get more of these um, dealerships to bid because if they don't bid, I can't buy. So that's kind of one of our hurdles is that I, you know, I know Lamoille Valley Ford, they sell the most EVs. They don't bid on our contracts. So I call them up and I say, why not? And they say, it's easier to sell them person in my door than it is to fill out a 50-page document and send it in and, and not even be guaranteed that I'm going to get a bid. And then there's some perception of, they, they think hundreds of vendors bid. I, mean, I can tell you there's probably five um, that consistently bid on these contracts. So that's one of our hurdles is I can buy the most fuel efficient vehicle on contract that's a cost competitive, but if it's not on contract, I can't buy it. Um, so that's a hurdle. We need, to, we need to figure out a way to get these vendors to be bidding. Um, yeah, and then, it's getting rid of as much red tape as you yeah. can. Yeah, and then the secondly, it's I have to have infrastructure. So, so I can I can say to a department, I the most cost effective vehicle is this plug-in hybrid EV. Well, who pays for the infrastructure? I don't really have the funding. I, I'm an internal service fund, so whatever I spend, I have to get back from the agency or department, and I don't have control over their budget. So they may not have the funds to install those charging stations. So. That's a little bit of a hurdle too that we just need to overcome. Once these charging stations come, the future's bright because the charging stations are already there. Now everything after that is easy. This is an important fact that Harmony just put up there. Her entire program is funded through internal service funds, rate setting to other departments that pay for the vehicles after the fact after she buys them. So she has a little bit of a cash flow from the treasurer, goes out, buys a vehicle, and charges the department the rate. We're not dealing in real cash and goes through the budgeting process. We're using the state treasurer's short-term borrowing you know, amount in terms of cash surplus to, to operate this program. And so we can't just go out and, and build charging stations because we don't have the money. That, the, the funding for the treasurer is for vehicles. It's not for charging stations. And so uh, this is an opportunity for us to build infrastructure to support the vehicles. We can go out buy the vehicles is the most fuel efficient vehicle using the treasurer's money to buy the vehicle. We just need a charging station to plug it into. So that's our constraint in your question in terms of accelerating the development and the deployment of these vehicles. It's really the charging station infrastructure which we need cash. Should we maybe have done more on that than, than purchasing 12 vehicles? Well we don't have enough fully electric vehicles and the governor was was very adamant that he wanted full electric vehicles, not plug-in hybrids, for the exposure to state employees. And answer those agencies and departments. So selling them on an infrastructure investment without ever exposing them to an electric vehicle, they're hands off. If their employees are already driving the electric vehicles and they're being exposed to them, now it's a little bit easier to sell. This is going to be successful. We've demonstrated it in the motor pool. You can do this. It's just a small investment. It'll be a little bit of easier sell than if I don't have any EVs and I'm out there trying to sell them investing in some infrastructure at their locations. Well, as usual, I agree with the government. <laughs> you, <laughs> Molly and Amir. Um, can you use the um, portion of the 18.7 million Volkswagen settlement that's set aside for charging stations? Can I think that has that? to be public use. So that, that's a, it's a different program. So that's a competitive program. 
charging stations that I believe the private sector will, you know, submit grant applications for for different charging locations. Um, it's not. Can't yeah, can do No, it's not how the program is set up. Mary, uh, I assume the um, charging stations you're talking about are level two. Yes. Um, is there any way of encouraging, you know, the drivers to kind of fill up at some level three that they're going by on the highway before they come back so that you know, they can be certain? I don't know of very many, yeah. um, but once they are available, absolutely. Um, it won't even it won't even be an option if we know they're driving by and they didn't stop and charge. I mean, we have some leverage to say you, you got to do this, just like we do when gas, right? We yeah. don't let our we don't let our renters come back with an empty tank of fuel. It's not respectful to the next renter, so we certainly give them feedback when they do that. It would be the same type of thing. You didn't fill up before you came back, and you had an opportunity because we have telematics, we can see you drove right by it. Um, so that would certainly, when they become more available. Uh, just a quick little point, uh, Commissioner. Uh, places that, that uh, when you're looking for a place, to a charging station, if you only have to bring in a level two, virtually every building in the state is, is already electrically equipped to, uh, to provide the service for that. Not all. So I tried to install, uh, there were multiple requests coming from the legislature last year for charging for legislators. So I tried to install some charging uh, in the legislative parking lot behind the Pink Lady. Yeah. In order to do that, I would need an entirely new sub panel. I would need new uh, electric. Uh, it just doesn't have the capacity. So the, it's normally $8,000 for a charging station. We were looking at thirty to $40,000 um, to, to, to just upgrade the property so it could handle charging stations. So that was an investment I didn't make because, one, I didn't. <laughs> Maybe some point you and I can walk around the back of the building together. <laughs> sure, but it's uh, it's the point that Harmony was raising earlier. She has a plan for deployment based upon data of uh, mobility needs, but we may go to easier locations depending upon what we find when we get there. All right. Well, thank you. I think it's great that you know, the commissioner has a lot of transportation experience. I don't know if he told you he first came here with transportation. That's why he came here. His first job in the I was thrilled to have it when I heard. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounds like you are just the perfect person for this job. Hope you don't leave. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Thank you. Oh, no problem? Yeah. Okay.
that this study always does is it identifies gaps. So the gaps, you know, we'll find out more when this study is concluded, which won't be until the fall. The other thing that we're in the middle of is we're working closely with a group in Montpelier on microtransit, which is a whole new a whole new way to deliver transit. So we're working closely with them and we've gone out for an IFP to get information from various groups that provide this kind of transportation. We had previously, a number of years ago, looked at Burlington and the, um, what was then the, uh, I completely forget their name, uh, <coughs> which I have, uh, but they've gone out of business. A number of these projects have started in bigger cities. Some have been mildly successful, some have failed completely. Um, so we're looking at how would it fit in Montpelier as a fairly dense, walkable community, um, fairly walkable community. Uh, so we're in the middle of that. Yeah. Or what is microtransit? I guess microtransit is uh, basically an on-demand transit. So you would sit there with your smartphone, and I'm at the state house, and I need to go grocery shopping, and you put it in just like Uber and Lyft, oh, and the bus would. Uh, constantly adjust its route to pick you up and take you where you are. There have been a number of, yeah, it's it's interesting, and nobody's quite find, found the right formula yet that didn't cost an arm and leg. Um, it's been tested in a couple of European cities. It, it's a big test here was in Kansas City, which I don't think the, the demonstration was well done, so it, it didn't work for a number of reasons. Um, where was that one? It was Kansas City. Um, so it, it's an emerging way to deliver transit. Um, and we, we're sort of waiting to see how, how it comes out. <coughs> but there's a very active group, which at 9 o'clock were, um, were testifying before the Senate Transportation Committee on that actual project. Um, we also have some public forums scheduled, and there's a, one in Cambridge, Underhill, and uh, Milton and to, to explore the same idea, and another one in Stowe and Morrisville. Um, Stowe and Morrisville is more about um, employment access than the others, uh, but we're, we're in the middle of, of those things, and we also just completed the mobility on demand project that we won competitively from the feds, and, here. and it was, uh, we completed it, we are the only one of the competitive winners that actually delivered what they said on time and under budget, and so therefore they put us, you can see our little cow bus, oh. on the cover of their recent um, report on our innovative projects. Uh, and this actually represented what that speaks to what you were looking at. We worked closely with, through our consultants with Google Transit to create what are called Google Flex specifications. Normally you go onto Google Maps and you say, I want to get from here to there and I want to get there on transit. And if there isn't transit within a quarter mile, it won't show you. However, this will go much farther so that it may be in the next town and around here you can get your mom to drive you or stick your thumb out on the highway or something. But it shows you what's actually available. Um, and you can get that on our Google Lines site. We've had a lot of interest from other states in that innovative project. They would like to expand that into their states. So we've got a lot going on right now. I'm not sure exactly what you would be looking for with a study other than generically increased ridership. The other project we have going on is our ADL, which we are almost completed rolling out. And what ADL is automatic vehicle locators. So you can say, um, I, I took three buses to get to high school when I was a kid. And the big thing was, did I just miss it? Or is it still, you know, is it two minutes late? Because back then all you could do was, you know, get down the street and it was pretty cold. Um, and so that project is now, we did three pilots over the last couple of years, and then we went out to bid and um, chose the one that we felt worked best based on our, our experiments. And we have started rolling that out across.
across the whole state. So eventually you'll be able to get it wherever you are for fixed route in, in Vermont. And then if you want to know more, then you go to uh, go Vermont and get the uh, wider Google Transit specs. And you can see what else is available. So we have a number of activities that we're doing um, specifically to increase transit and to increase, to increase transit ridership and information about transit so that people can see what's out there. Um, and being in the middle of the public transit policy plan, starting another project to research how to increase ridership, I, I guess for myself, and this is an official VTrans position because we haven't really had a chance to talk about it much, is I'd like to see what comes out of that, that modal plan before we move I would just say that um, we just haven't crossed this line yet of serious ridership on transit. I would say even in Burton uh, and, and even the link, there's, there's really one link in the morning and one in the afternoon that's got the kind of ridership that a bus ought to have. The other runs do not. So they put the mall, and you know, sometimes you can be one of five or six people. And that's our, you know, what we call, our, when we point to is successful because it, some of the runs are, have a lot of people. There's no way near, it doesn't you know, touch what uh, really could. And uh, Mary didn't even know about it, but apparently the NPO in our region is looking to spend five hundred thousand dollars to widen the middle lane on the interstate. Chittenden County really is like a uh, it's a microcosm. It's like a big city. There's places you can stand on the old fashioned and look down at bumper to bumper frozen traffic. As far as the eye can see. On the bus population in Chittenden County. It's nothing with big cities, but the traffic is becoming increasingly reminiscent of those places. And that's this one place. Pine Street down in Hoosier Street, northbound. That's a couple of hours of the rush hour. Pump for the pump. Canes, you know. Uh, Wilson Road coming in. Uh, all the way um, over Main Street and down Main Street, the buses are in mean, that traffic too, and that's, that's where I see it from. We're all delayed by it, frustrated by it. So even in Burlington and Chittenden County, we are not somehow getting people to take the bus. Uh, and it's certainly true in the rural areas too. There's, there's no doubt in my mind it can work. Because as you know, we loved your story, I loved your story about um, how quickly people form carpools and were happy to do it and kind of enjoy themselves just because the building was closed down. You know, so it doesn't take much, but we're somehow not doing it. So and some of us, including some of the uh, representatives of rural areas, want to see more transit, but we all know it has to work. I was talking to somebody from Franklin County, uh, coming into the state house, a friend, who um, talked about how old she rode buses when she was young, going to school, but how the bus off her way, very, you know, very low ridership. The main bus to and from the same house. So, um, I guess I would just ask if, at other places, look at places where transit does work, places that aren't so urban. And I think sometimes that means looking at you know, Europe, Denmark, and those places that are urban, but they're not all urban. You know, I spent six months in the south of France. Um, people ride buses there uh, at, at, at decreasing numbers, I think. Yeah. They become more, more like us. Um, but it's rural, where I was. Yeah. And so people 
have more than you There has been a very recent report, I mean, in the last week on ridership trends across the country and what where it's been successful and where not. And I haven't had a chance to read the entire book. It's a book. Um, it, it just came out. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things, of course, is going to come up is land use. We're right back to land use. In Europe, uh, I know our friends, um, I have some friends that live in Scotland, and when they bought a house, they have no children. They have no plan to have children. They're not of the age where they could have children. But they weren't actually allowed to buy a house in an area unless there was room in the schools. So if you compare that to the way we could just go buy this farmland and a house, you know, it, it certainly makes transit easier in places with more strong um, land use controls than we have here. But you know, there is this recent study, and we will review it at, at the state. And then one of the things that happens when we do these policy plans is they reveal a gap, they reveal a potential, and we often follow them up with a study directed to that specific potential. The first one was done, I'm going to say 98. It was before my time, so I'm totally guessing here. But one of the things I pointed out was the need for more, um, more transportation for the elderly and disabled. And so then there was a big investment made, now $4 million, just from VTrans, not necessarily from um, the Agency of Human Services, in transportation for the other way to say. The next study, which was five or six years later, um, exposed the need for more commuter transit. And that's where the links were born. That's where the uh, transportation into White River Junction and New Hampshire came out, and so more investment was made in there. And then the most recent one was inner cities, and we followed that up with another study that specifically looked at inner city. And um, so I think, I guess my preference is simply to wait to see what, it, does it say we need more transportation just for work? Does it say we need a better mobility management system so any one person can call? Right now they call me. Um, <laughs> because it's kind of a hobby of mine and say, well, how do I get from here to there? And often what I hear uh, is, oh, I didn't know there was a bus. And I mean, I've even hired people that say, well, you don't even have any transportation here. Until they get a job that requires them to look at it, oh my god, there's buses everywhere. So I, I'm kind of waiting for that and to see what's in this study and to see what we do next um, in innovation and how our ABL works. Because otherwise, I think it would be kind of generic. I'd like to have I just would really like to say I support what Barbara's saying. I'd love to have a continuing conversation that we do have. You know, we, we keep communicating what is happening because I think you do have a really good pulse and you're looking at a lot of studies already. And I would just hate to spin your wheels on something new that we're not really sure exactly targeted what we're asking of you. And, and if you know, you've got something that's coming forward that will potentially give us some, some answers to ask the question from. <laughs> I think that would be really helpful. One of the things that's been happening nationally, as the price of gas goes down and a number of other factors um, are involved, is ridership in the cities has been going down. And that's followed with our only city that ridership has dropped. I'm sorry, I can't um, But our rural ridership has bucked the trends, and that's been going up. And I think that some of that's because of targeting. Um, I think a lot of it is cultural and also the price of gas, which is going up. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, and I know, I remember, you know, when the price of gas went way up, I think the campfire ownership really increased a lot. Yeah, um, 
I know that um, there, there are two things that I'd love to hear you weigh in on. One was, you know, we had heard some great discussion about the development of the software, um, and, you know, I've been kind of toying around with going to Vermont and seeing, could I get from St. Albans to Montpelier, and it would take about two hours and one interchange, but I could totally ride both of those kids to Montpelier and get back if I timed it right. Um, and when I think about using the bus and the folks who can commute from St. Albans to Burlington on the bus, like my friend Jack down the street, um, he uh, would really love it if there were more time so that if he did get stuck late or had a child care pickup from school issue, that he'd be able to make a choice from a couple of different buses. And I know that, that just having that one service back and forth is, is creates that kind of anxiety about using a bus on some days and sometimes of the year. And so is part of the thinking around, especially those commuter routes, planning for that. So I'd love to hear your feedback on, will the Go Vermont data, if I go on Google and I say, how do I get from here to here with the transit protocols that are there, can I? Will I be able to get those routes soon on most of our special commuter routes? Because if some of them are in there and some of them aren't now. Well, I'll double check on that because I, I thought they were all in there. But one thing, certainly if you give me their name, we can contact them. But one of, if they register with Go Vermont, they get the emergency ride home. So if your friend gets a call from school and they say, Psh, we're not leaving this kid here, they're infecting everyone, come yeah. get them. They can, um, there's a couple of options. They can get a taxi, they can get a state car, and or they can rent a car. That will then be reimbursed up to, I think, 10 times a year. Um, but just knowing that that's there changes everything, especially for parents. That's a big deal. Um, when I, at my old job, I used to carpool. And when one of us got deathly ill, the rest of us were just like, OK, fine, no problem. We'll all go home and we we'll work from home. But that doesn't work well in most places. So that's why we have the emergency ride home. And so you can either just tell them about registering with Go Vermont, or you can get us the information and we will contact them directly. That's great. OK, anything else from Barbara? Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, you're the, the witness. Yes. Peter Young, I'm with Vermont Rail. 
No, I am frequently in Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> Rumor has it. Bridget right. Morris with uh, Morris and Mag. Kanika Gandhi with Beeper. Costa Pat is the Agency of Transportation <laughs> Planning Section. And Jim Dandino with Premier Pepper Agnes and Craig. So um, I was asked to come before the committee today uh, with a proposal of language for um, uh, taking a look at. Um, further feasibility analysis of the use of um, DMUs, diesel multiple units, um, rail cars on um, Vermont uh, railroad tracks. Um, I guess I would first distinguish that um, we have um, two principal operating railroads in Vermont. There's a, another small section up in the Newport area that I'll exclude from our discussions at the moment. Um, but um, Genesee and Wyoming operating as New England Central Railroad is a principal owner and operator of uh, major lines which carry the um, Vermonter and truck Vermonter and uh, has a robust freight uh, network uh, through the state as well. And then Vermont Rail Systems, uh, representative, uh, represented by Peter Young today, which um, uh, leases the state-owned railroad uh, in several parts of the state and um, assists in providing Amtrak service from Rutland uh, through to uh, New York City, and uh, that service will eventually um, terminate in Burlington, Vermont, instead of Rutland, um, with the completion of our uh, current project that we're working on. Um, so um, I think the committee has heard before that the, um, the utilization of DMUs on Vermont rail networks is a complex matter. Um, I have Dan DeLabore here, and Costa Pappas, who um, have uh, spent a lot of time looking at the issue of uh, this matter in particular a few years ago when we prepared uh, the feasibility study for um, uh, rail system upgrades for commuter rail service uh, for the legislature, and this was published in February of 2017. Um, this, this Outreach for this study involved um, an extended, extensive amount of public outreach uh, and working with communities, regional planning commissions, uh, the railroads, uh, the transit providers, um, and went into quite an extensive amount of detail on the costs and a lot of the upgrade issues that would be involved uh, to implement commuter rail service, not the least of which is that any operation of rail service on the railroad owned by Genesee and Wyoming or leased by Vermont Rail Systems requires their permission uh, before an operator can undertake an activity. Um, there's also quite a, an extensive distinction between um, commuter rail service, which is something that the Federal Transit Administration oversees. Uh, and has a whole body of requirements, and including safety requirements, et cetera, accessibility requirements, um, timing, et cetera, uh, and um, intercity passenger rail service, which is what the Federal Rail Administration oversees and what Amtrak delivers. Um, so I think that um, there was some criticism of the feasibility study from 2017, highlighting the fact that um, the analysis was really focused on something more akin to what you might see in the Boston area in terms of a, a commuter rail service and did not delve deeply enough into um, how we might look at a small scale version of um, a rail service um, enterprise uh, for um, a Vermont scale activity. Uh, the um, effort to augment the study to better articulate some of those issues uh, was undertaken and, and the study was addended to reflect that. Um, however, I think that what the committee is asking for is a deeper dive on the particular um, analysis for what the implications would be for uh, looking at the DMU service, including first whether or not it would even be uh, allowed to go forward by the operating railroads, um, which are not compelled to provide access. I think there's been some uh, 
mischaracterization of a grant that was received by the New England Central Railroad under the Americans Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, a few years ago where a significant amount of federal funds, just under $100 million, was uh, provided along with matching funds from the railroad to upgrade the Vermonter line to provide um, more efficient Amtrak passenger service. And um, they met their obligations for um, that investment uh, through the agreements um, to upgrade for Amtrak passenger service. There are no remaining agreements in terms of them allowing any other you know, public service uh, rail activity to occur on their line. So I just want to make sure that people are aware of that. So um, the agency, uh, if the committee desires, would be willing to take a deeper dive. Um, our estimates to what it would entail to look at the, the accessibility, the insurance, the, the rail infrastructure requirements, the, um, you know, what a feasible operating schedule uh, would look like, what fares would be, what, what underwriting of uh, subsidies for passenger fares would need to be for operational service cost uh, coverage, um, who potential operators might be, um, what what impact this would have on providing transit to Vermonters. Um, you know, some people might leave riding a bus in order to ride a train and that would have implications if we were to set up a commuter rail system and bus drivers were displaced on the transit network. There are union requirements that FTA requires um, sort of replacement of those um, you know, sort of lost opportunities for transit drivers to be addressed. So there's a whole complexity of, of requirements and issues that we uh, would be able to delve into and, and help you better understand uh, through undertaking this analysis. Uh, we paid about $88,000 for the first feasibility study that we undertook. We estimate that this deep dive to look at the issues and properly articulate them for uh, the legislature would be about on the same scale, from $75,000 to $100,000. Um, and we would um, basically um, be able to undertake that within the framework of our um, planning budget that you have before you, so we're not looking for any additional money to undertake this, uh, but undertaking this means we won't undertake something else. I don't know what that is right at the moment, but um, it will either slow down other projects or um, will um, you know, displace something that we had in the schedule. Um, so the language that we've proposed um, basically keeps it pretty simple in terms of recognizing that um, the service area that um, appears to be the area of interest, and, and you can let me know if we have this wrong, would be the uh, St. Albans, Essex Junction, Burlington, and Montpelier um, sort of commuter service area. And um, we would report our findings to the House and Senate Transportation Committees. We would work in coordination with the Joint Fiscal Office, of course. Um, and we would do this uh, on or before January 15th, so the standard reporting period. Um, we indicate we would basically build upon the framework that we used uh, for this study um, uh, and that um, you know, we would basically be needing to be sort of referencing some of the things we already learned in this study, but we would be taking the deeper dive relative to the, the DMUs. Um, this study, as I mentioned earlier, had an extensive public process to it um, and was a more traditional planning study. Um, we characterize what we would uh, undertake for you in this as a technical analysis, not a planning study. Um, we would certainly make um, the, the public and municipalities aware that this study is being undertaken. We would do that through the regional planning commissions. We would not hold public hearings and go through all of that process. That would just add a significant amount of cost. I don't think the uh, thing Excuse we're trying to Michelle. Yeah. Anthony, is this in our um, register? Yeah. No, it's it's no, it's not. It's a separate post on our website, the committee room's agenda page. It's the oh, oh, that's right. Thanks. No, go back down. Maddie posted it out there. It's the two minutes ago. Oh, great. Okay, got it. No, sorry, that was the wrong one. 
but it's in there, it's in that list. If you go back to that list, pick a different one. And if you were to incorporate it, it would be at the very end, it's already 25 items. Everybody else. Sorry, I'm the agenda page. No worries. Pause for a minute. I was sort of <laughs> needing to catch a breath. <laughs> okay, I got it. Okay. So, being a feasibility study, um, we would use our already engaged um, technical assistance and communications and outreach. Um, uh, measures what we use with our regional planning commission partners to notify communities through their transportation advisory committees that we are investigating this. Um, we would work closely with um, stakeholders who have a specific potential interest in this, including uh, All Earth Rail, VRS, uh, New England Central, uh, G&W, uh, and uh, Green Mountain Transit, um, and uh, any of the other um, transit agencies, GMT, I think, covers most of the service area, so that kind of takes care of that. But, um, and, um, you know, we would come back to you with the details I mentioned before. Um, so, um, this is the framework we've come up with, and I'm um, happy to pause here for questions. Well, I just have a question, because I know we've heard a small presentation from All Earth Rail earlier this session. And there was no actual operator. They just saw the cars. So, I mean, are we studying something that there really isn't a service available yet? So, um, that is our understanding. Um, we have not seen a proposal yet for um, a framework. I think that there is an interest by um, All Earth Rail and uh, Champ P3, which is an entity, it's a nonprofit entity that was formed to look at public-private partnership um, activities, which include commuter rail service. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, this is the type of thing where if all the parts came together and you had uh, a, a, an agreeable um, railroad willing to open up their lines for service, if you had um, a, a enti an entity that had um, equipment like All Earth Rail does, um, and then if um, there was a proposal put forth to find an operator, um, then you know maybe somebody would come forward. Um, I think that um, given the fact that our state resources are constrained, um, using state funds to help underwrite an operator to deliver this type of service, and potentially having to cut back on transit service, which you know we've heard a lot about this session. Um, would be a tension that the legislature would have to uh, investigate in terms of what their interest in, what your interest in uh, funding such a thing would be. Um, but the agency of transportation is is not an operator of transportation services. Um, Barbara talks about the transit service we deliver. That's all delivered through operators. Okay, we don't deliver operations. We don't fly the planes. We don't drive the trains. We you know, we don't uh, do any of those things. And so uh, I just want to make sure it's clear that the state would not be an operator of such an endeavor in uh, any future we imagine. Mark? So that's not to say, though, that an existing operator like Green Mountain Transit right. couldn't add that service. Yeah, it's, it's quite often that a transit authority um, undertakes commuter rail service. I think that's the standard model nationwide, um, under my observation. Um, sometimes there are special authorities that do rail only uh, transit, but it's commuter transit typically. Um, so uh, so I am not discounting the fact that there might be an operator out there willing to undertake this service. Yeah, Green Mountain Transit really respects a lot of trenches actually being out there. Uh, you know, we have in the room uh, representatives from New England Central and uh, Vermont Rail Systems. And so has there been dialogue with them about uh, anything to do with this? And if there hasn't, uh, are they willing to 
testify a little bit as to what they think about uh, the possibility of this, or is it impossible from their viewpoint? Uh, I would sort of like to hear uh, the, uh, their side of the story a little bit, if that's possible. Yep. I, I think it is. I'm happy to relinquish the chair. So <laughs> Maybe you can answer their expression to you, which is what you don't do. Um, so I think that the uh, two railroad companies are aware of um, the the fact that there is um, that that All Earth Rail has purchased equipment, and that there are entities out there who are interested in uh, moving forward with this type of venture. And I think, like VTrans, we've been uh, the railroads have been listening and interested, um, but have been waiting for a business plan, waiting for at least we've been waiting for a business plan and waiting for sort of a, a framework of how this would work. And um, and so, um, you know, I, I was contacted yesterday by Champ P3, who wants to come in and have a dialogue about a public-private partnership proposal. Um, they've certainly given presentations of a conceptual model, but I think that. Um, the state is still um, in, a, in a receiving information standpoint because we are not clear that um, the railroads would open their, um, their, their infrastructure resources to such a service and we've not seen an operating budget or plan as to how this type of thing would operate. So we're still um, receiving information. I mean, it would be a shame to spend $100,000 on a plan that there's, it's not possible to implement it. And so, it, it would, wouldn't it be logical that, I'm not sure where the, which comes first, the chicken or the egg here, but it, it, I'd hate to see a thousand, $100,000 spent on a plan when it's not feasible to do that. Yeah, I understand. I mean, we are stewards of public resources and, and we certainly, um, we, we don't like to waste them. Okay, so now you're happy to yes. do it this time. <laughs> so stay close. Oh, I will I'm, I'm assuming that somebody from uh, uh, Genesee, Wyoming, and Vermont, we also think, would like to speak to us. Uh, for a few minutes, we actually scheduled just work on this for 10 more minutes. Everyone's looking at me. Um, <laughs> you were in the room. Yeah, I know that's you don't have to prepare I'm happy that, to so. speak from, from here or take the witness to whatever it's more convenient. Um, State your name just for the Peter Young uh, with Vermont Rail. Um, and uh, what you heard earlier is right. We're certainly willing to give a close look at any proposal once it's on the table. We've had uh, some back and forth with all work. Obviously, we've coordinated the movement of uh, the actual flood cars uh, along the system. So we know there's interest. Uh, we're waiting for a proposal that we can look at closely. Uh, as committee members, probably recall the time of the Champlain Flyer, we put the operator for that um, project on that stretch of time. Uh, a lot of things have changed in the 15 or so years. Uh, there's a lot of detail to look at. And we've made it clear that we're willing to give a close look uh, when, there's, when there's interest and when the time is right to get those, those details in place. That's probably all I can say, <laughs> without, <laughs> without details. So. Yeah. I guess I, before we next I'd like to just say that I don't think we we're going to get a business plan from the from the owners of the cars. I think that company has bought the cars so that hopefully the, they could be used to demonstrate. That's been my understanding, yeah. um, but certainly um, Nick represents them is in the room. Maybe yeah. Did you correct. agree with what I just said, Nick? I think that's a fair representation. Yeah. So without your cooperation, we cannot go forward with commuter rail in Vermont. I have to be thoughtful in my answer, right? I think you appreciate it. Um, we're willing to give a good close look to it. There's a lot of detail. Um, I know that the agency has mentioned the insurance issues, positive uh, PTC issues. The, um, there are a lot of details to work through, any, any and all of which could be significant, if not you know, very real hurdles to Did the you operation. Say PTC? 
Yes, PTC. Positive training control criteria. So I mean, there is, you know, we are obviously involved in an effort now to uh, bring the Amtrak service all the way up to Burlington. That requires uh, coordination and securing exceptions to that requirement. Um, there's a lot that has changed in the 15 years since the Champlain Flyer operated. Um, there's whole other sections of federal regulations that apply or may apply depending on the nature of the service. So um, we're ready to look and give it a close look and try to find a way to make this um, feasible. But I can't tell you that there's a clear path ahead without an understanding of how they propose to address all these other various issues. Okay. Uh, who owned and operated the Champlain Flyer? Did, be, be, did uh, Vermont Rail, Rail was an operator. This is before my time, so I'm, I'm getting a little out of my league. Um, I believe it was a Vermont Transit Agency. The Vermont Transportation Authority. The Vermont Transportation Authority was what I, in my mind, thought of as the sponsor. And, but we did operate, yes. Vermont Rail did operate the, um, the trains. So you, Vermont Rail Systems owned the cars that were used? Yeah, I believe the state no. owned the cars, and effectively the state operated the, the service. Um, I mean, didn't operate day to day, but controlled the operations and put the bill for the whole thing. Our folks moved the trains, but it was not uh, it was not a kind of a turnkey situation where we ran it you know, on our own. So, but this is this is going back some time, and the landscape has certainly changed in a lot of ways. So, um, like I said we've done it before. Uh, we found a way forward, and we're certainly willing to give it a close close look like, to find a way forward if that's something that the state wants to pursue. Okay. I realize we have limited time, but you said that there were various hurdles that you didn't know if you'd be able to overcome. Could you just tell I what are some of those hurdles? Uh, positive train control, insurance coverage, um, scheduling around existing freight service. Uh, depending on the routes, we have you know, coordination and cooperation with other railroads. Um, and I believe the uh, folks from Midland Central may be prepared to give up more detailed list, but um, we have, it, there's a lot of weeds to get into, um, entire parts of federal regulations, which we don't usually have to deal with, and the regulatory environment out of D.C. continues to shift and change, so. Yeah, I guess, with that being said, I would really hope that when you say a deeper dive into this, that that's really transparently true, uh, because this is something that I hear, I'm in white room country. And although the study doesn't go that far south, uh, potentially, uh, this is something I hear time and time again from my constituents that they would like to see. Uh, so I, I do truly hope that this is not um, that this is not something that gets shelved because it's difficult, um, because it is something that people are truly asking for. And to be clear, we don't operate between period and point of production. Sure. So there are yes. a lot of. So Groups in the room. Yeah. So um, I you know. Yeah. But we're we are. You know. We're prepared to give a, a, a close look. And said we have experience with the Champlain Flyer um, to the extent it is something that we can we can get behind and make work. We're prepared to do that. Can I see my chair to oh, yes, the large can. engine first? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know. No. Okay. Yeah. You're okay. Yeah, well, does everyone to speak? Uh, well, it depends on the question, so uh, I'll lead it, but maybe all three of us can reintroduce ourselves. Uh, Charles Hunter, AVP, Government Affairs of Genesee Mining. Jerry Vest, Senior Vice President of Government and Industry Affairs for Genesee Mining. John Conley, Vice President of Operations for Genesee Mining, Northeast Region. So um, maybe I could just start with just a few comments, and I know time is short, but you all have asked some excellent questions. And just to format uh, the situation as we see it. Uh, New England Central is a class three common carrier short line freight railroad. And you can effectively think of a railroad like the New England Central as the first and last mile for freight transportation. And they 
we connect Vermont to Canada, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, Connecticut directly, but more importantly, we connect the communities and customers we serve to the National Urban Freight Network. And so we give them access to markets and um, suppliers, customers that they wouldn't otherwise have without access to rent. Um, our objective at GNW, first and foremost, is to do what we do safely. Our, our motto at our company is to be the safest and most respected transportation provider in the world. And we have historically been the safest shoreline company in the United States. Um, we strive to focus on safety and customer service. Because we are small companies, we're made up of a bunch of small companies like the New England Central, our economics are such that we have to be flexible, we have to drive for new business all the time. So we acquired the New England Central uh, back in 2012 when we acquired Rail America <coughs> and the railroad and Mr. Hunter both came to us at that time. And we're, we're very happy on both acquisitions. But um, we, we came to Vermont with a clear understanding of the commitment the New England Central has to Amtrak rail passenger service. We came to the state understanding the desire to extend the service to Montreal north of St. Albans, and we also appreciate that there could eventually be a second round trip train. We understand these um, uh, understandings and uh, expectations of the railroad, not just from the state, but Amtrak, but really everyone. So, and we've worked very hard to be a, a good, superior, really a superior host railroad for Amtrak. We, we try to support that service every way we can, and VTrans has been a very active partner with us in supporting Amtrak service. So you all know some of the criteria well and what it means for any state, but certainly a smaller state like Vermont, to support passenger service. To the best of my knowledge, there is not a passenger service, rail passenger service in the world that covers its fully allocated costs. And you all see that in the PREA state subsidy for the Amtrak service in your state. It can be very expensive. So we were first approached by CHAMP P3 last year. We had a meeting with them, John Connolly. And who was CHAMP P3? Uh, Lee Kahn was at the meeting. P3 representative. Is it an organization that's I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I can't give you the full background yeah. of the group, but they represented as working with all or having access to these uh, self propelled diesel rail cars and interested in starting this computer service across the that, that is how they presented themselves to us. So we sat down with them. John was at that meeting, and our senior regional vice president was at that meeting, and he is the president of the New England Central. Um, and we had a preliminary discussion. Out of that discussion, we made clear that we needed a much more detailed plan, a business plan, from CHAMP P3 in order to advance talks with them about the feasibility of this. There are things like, let me just run down a brief list if I could, it might be helpful. First and foremost, we have concerns about safety. The proposed service would mix passing new passenger service by a third company, a new operator, in with current New England Central, Pan Am, and um, Amtrak services on our railroad. Uh, so anytime there's that type of co-mingling, we always immediately have a primary concern about how can this be done safely. And that ties to a lot of different things. The experience of whoever would operate it, the quality of the equipment, uh, meeting all federal mandates. And at GNW, we pride ourselves that we view federal requirements as a minimum. And our operating standards often exceed the minimum federal requirements for safer operations as part of how we are as safe as we are. There is a lot of attention, and it came up in this meeting last fall with CHAMP, about positive train control. As you all, I'm sure, know, the Vermonter service now operates with a positive train control waiver. Uh, 
this without that waiver, that service would be uneconomical for New England Central. And the reason why Amtrak would have the PTC equipment, but we would have to go through the entire railroad in which the Amtrak service operates over and equip it for possible train control. It would be millions and millions and millions of dollars. And we I just wanted a, a clarifier, which is, so I think we, as a committee, understand that if positive training control would be really expensive, but I, I wanted to know, maybe this is a question that's better for Michelle than you, Jerry, but would the study that, that as we proposed it, help us determine whether or not we could operate a DMU commuter service without having to make those investments in positive training? Um, in the end, it will be a decision of the FRA on whether or not possible train control is required in Amtrak and us as the host railroad. And honestly, we have not determined whether we would be comfortable with this new overlay of passenger service and mixed with the current services on the New England Central, if we would be comfortable for that to happen without possible train control. I mean, it's there. Positive train control was created as a federal mandate for a very specific reason. The waiver that we have for the Amtrak the Monitor Service is contingent upon some very specific conditions, and introducing a new service on top of that could mingle with it could fundamentally change this. Without going through a formal process, it's almost impossible to tell. But I would suggest the study should probably be based on the likelihood of the positive train control would be required. So, I mean, if it, it, it's out there, it would be hard not to implement it with this new complexity of the operation. I mean, it would be exceeding what we, it, well, I have to be careful because we really don't know what this service is, just what we've heard informally, but it's highly likely it could exceed whatever trip into the positive train control requirements. But I mean, you all as a committee need to think too, again, that is out there for a reason. The federal government implemented it for a reason, it was to ensure safety. So it's just not a cost, and not, I'm not suggesting you're thinking of it any other way, but it's not a cost just to overlook it. It very well could be that it is needed here. But safety is first and foremost. We also have to look at capacity. We have, as I said, a, a tenant, Freight railroad that operates on this line. We have Amtrak and we have our own services. And our objective is to grow our business. I mean, we, we believe we can help Vermont by handling more freight on our railroad. It certainly would help the economy. Um, it would help the environment. Uh, I, I tell folks that the typical company that we serve, their, their employees who get life or family sustaining incomes out of them. It's not like the, the readers of Walmart. Exist. But I heard they were doing away with those jobs, so I'm going to change that line. But, um, but that, that is our focus, is how we can help the economy and the environment of Vermont by providing safe and efficient freight services. Well, I think that brings up a good point. When we're looking at the holistic aspect of, of transit in Vermont, it's people and goods. And so between your testimony and then an hour ago when we were talking about buses and things, you know, maybe in our head to think about the fact that you know, buses are good for people and if we could get the freight off the roads, it might really assist with the jams that the chair was speaking of and the building capacity. So I think that looking at each transit mode for what it could best provide to us is, is really valuable. So even if it isn't the bud cars transporting us on the same route that we're trying to get people to get on the bus for, it might be you know just really maximizing the use of rail for the freight and getting that off our highways. So. And, and this capacity point, the second point, is significant, especially for a short line, because the one way we maintain our profitability and thus our ability to continue to exist and do our, our mission is by having our assets sized to the level that we need them. We don't, we don't have the luxury to maintain extra track just for the sake of possibility of needing it. So adding a new service and any passenger service will be time sensitive. You know, it will never succeed unless we maintain a schedule. We understand that. We understand that with Amtrak service. But it puts a whole new dynamic on our assets required. Um, 
there's another element that, that was mentioned by the gentleman representing Vermont Railway, and that is insurance. And I would take that further to talk about indemnification. I mean, this is really a but-for situation with indemnification. We're not seeking out a new passenger service on our railroad. We have an established protocol that is in place for Amtrak, but that is only for Amtrak service. And so we would be looking for a significant amount of insurance and also indemnification if any incident occurred uh, whatsoever associated with the new passenger service. And I'm not an expert in this area, I'm not an attorney, but from what I've seen in other states that requires an act of the legislature to provide that level of indemnification. So for a commuter rail service. Um, and then the final area that I just very high level just wanted to touch on is compensation. I mean, it's, I, I tell folks when I go into VTrans or state DOT for the first time, and I, I really mean this, it's amazing to me the parallels between a railroad like the Union Central and VTrans. We both own and are responsible to maintain miles and miles and miles of infrastructure, linear infrastructure, and having, I'll speak as a person that previously ran a regional railroad, it's a black hole, and you all know this. I mean, the, the money required to maintain that transportation infrastructure network is endless. Uh, the, I'm sure you all get into the way of appropriations every year, and it's a challenge. I mean, and that's how what we have to do. We have to manage our revenues and expenses so we have enough money to have enough to maintain all of these assets. Right? They're so capital intensive. So, we would be looking to do this for compensation, if nothing else, to put the railroad out. And part of it goes back to where I started, and that is if the passenger service can't cover its fully allocated costs, no passenger service, where does the money come from? And so part of what we would need in a business plan is the financial durability of such a service to be funded. This is a major undertaking that, that would, a study would require. And that was part of why we asked Chan P3 for a business plan up front to be able to help us understand does this have legs to pursue with them? Because for us to look at our assets, our capacities, to get into discussions about uh, safety and compensation, we don't have the management capacity to do that for someone like Chan. They need to carry some of that themselves. And they told us when we met with them that their concept would be privately funded. And so it gives me pause that now they're looking for the state legislature to provide the funds for a feasibility study up front. I have a couple of people that are very expert on the main central with me. Uh, the three of us can answer questions if you, if you have any. So. I have a, a couple of questions, and to, to really get at the, the heart of the study, I want to make sure that we're not confusing having the information in order to know how to build that business plan with the creation of that business plan. I think we heard from Michelle, and, and I hope that you heard that the, if we took on the feasibility study, that it wouldn't be a creation of a business plan for a private entity. Um, and then the other thing is, um, Jerry, you talked a lot about the jobs and the economic impacts of the railroad. I'm, I'm the representative of St. Albans, and we deeply, deeply appreciate the relationship that we have with Genesee, Wyoming, and NCR and the home there. Um, and I've been hearing a lot about um, potential change of location of the rail dispatch center, and I'm wondering, Charlie, are you might be able to talk to the rumors that we've been hearing pretty consistently in St. Albans about that? I, it's my understanding that we came to the state with an incentive, and I'm sure we will follow through. I mean, our company follows through on its obligations. Beyond that, I don't have information. They're exploring other locations. There's been nothing. I checked this morning before I came here because I thought the question might be asked. There's been nothing agreed upon at this stage, but they are exploring other locations. That's a very old building. That's part of the concerns is, is the maintenance of that building. And from an operating standpoint, as GMW has continued to grow, uh, as you know, St. Albans is our hub of dispatching and crew home. Right. There's no intention of changing that. If, if there is some exploration 
outside of that building, and I'm fairly confident in saying that it has nothing to do with relocation of people or, or jobs outside the immediate region. Okay, I know our city manager and mayor who were very uh, urgent with me at our city council meeting on Monday night. I'm very happy to hear that reassurance. I think their biggest concern was that people who are located in the St. Albans area would really appreciate the jobs that you all have at that road dispatch center. They're really good jobs. To have people have to commute to Chip County or some other location. Um, where, I don't know, where, where's Chip County? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're not looking there. <laughs> <laughs> it's out half an hour. Uh, yeah, so they, yeah they, they, they're, you know, they're hearing all kinds of stuff about uh, moving the REC to Colchester or something like that. Right. So, you know, half an hour south, basically. So I really appreciate that reassurance. Yeah, and that building, like I said, it, it does offer some growth constraints because the more jobs I put in there, or we put in there as a company, um, eventually you start running out of space. So looking for some panic space. And, possible or options. I mean, we're always looking at other options. But Jerry's point, we're going to look at uh, every obligation. Thank you very, very much. The, a railroad dispatcher is a highly, highly qualified position. You know, we have a good, great base of employees in St. Albans. So, and as things are balanced out, certainly that weighs the fact that those employees live and work in St. Albans now. Balances that scale to the favor of what we want to change. I think the counterbalance is just the age and the ability of that building to be our needs. So. And I would just say, uh, and I'll stop getting us totally derailed here, Mr. Chair. Thank you for no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, no, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, to sorry. To that. <laughs> yeah. Didn't even think through that uh, that metaphor. Um, so uh, the the mayor and other folks who brought this concern to my attention in anticipation of you coming were very quick to say um, the city and our partners have been doing a lot of redevelopment work and if there is in the future any concern about that particular building but the desire to stay in St. Albans and keep that highly skilled, highly trained workforce to be able to work locally, that we would really love to have the lines of communication be wide open with people like our mayor Tim Smith to find them. If, if it would be acceptable, maybe Charles, you could sure. coordinate a meeting, a, a discussion. I mean, if there's that type of local uh, government leadership concern, we should be sitting down talking to them. Great. So, Thank yeah, you. I'll be glad to sit down with you and Tim. Maybe get some yeah. of our management our team. The ARDC team. Sure. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Anything else? Hey. Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I don't know, maybe really this could be a good thing for you to comment about is. Would this DMU project compete with Amtrak in terms of would it cut into to their ridership? Do you think? I think when you talk a little bit about uh, that, that, that's a great question. I don't have the ability. I mean, I think VTrans probably would be in a better situation to respond to that. Maybe <laughs> She's got the study in her hands. I recognize. Um, without opening the crack in the study. Um, you know, I think that um, there certainly are people, uh, Vermonters, who use Amtrak in-state uh, to get around. I wouldn't say that's a really large number. I think most people are taking Amtrak for inner-city long-distance travel. And so um, I would not suspect that uh, this type of operation that we've talked about today would impact our Amtrak service that greatly. I took it to the right river junction for my six junction last month. <laughs> Think about a commuter rail that can take you yeah. there whenever you want. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, where we left off was with draft 3.1 of the T bill, and you now have draft 4.1. And I believe Maddie has printed out hard copies for everyone, along with this chart that will tell you what the old section was and the new section. This was based on the request that things be um, regrouped so that it had a more cohesive flow to it. Um, obviously, you've seen at least one handout today that had a designation for Section 25A. Um, this afternoon, you'll be seeing a bunch of ones that are Section 20 with um, little letters afterwards. I can renumber at the end so that you've got sort of a normal flow to your section numbers. Um, I was planning, unless um, 
the chair and the committee would like me to do something different to sort of walk through just the changes that have happened since the version 3.1. Um, I have marked on my version a couple follow-up items that I needed to report back to you on. And I'll also um, comment on whether or not it's a section that Maddie has you have already sort of dealt with. Um, unless you want me to do something else. That was I asked? Yes. So I don't know if that we're going over that again. I was going to start at section one and go from there unless I was told to do something different. All right. Um, yeah, and let's think about if anybody has any motions on any of these sections, um, we will entertain them. Okay. And I just was going to say, um, Patty did say she wouldn't be able to be back until after lunch, and if we did make any motions, she'd like the vote be held open for her. Yeah. So I'm going to start with section one. Okay. Um, now, and just tell us, where, where do we find what you're... So this is in documents and handouts for the House Transportation page. If you go to Wednesday, March 13th, 2019, everything I'm going to talk about is now posted under my name. So do you have up what's on the screen? If you go, yes, I do. okay, it's the, the very top. Yeah. Okay. So section one, this is the standard language that says we're adopting the whole book except for how we're amending it in the transportation bill because um, the magic Lenny and his team came in and changed all your pages while you were at your joint assembly. We are now, and they have the stickers on the side saying that they were revised February 21st, 2019. I'm adding that in here so everyone's clear on what version of the book you're working off of. That revised book has been filed with the SARA, so it will sort of travel with the bill, as I always say. You've got your transportation bill, but whenever you've got the official version of it, you need to imagine that the binder is attached to the back of it. So that's this small change on line 15. Okay. Section 2. This is a lot of what you were talking about with Lenny yesterday. This language is going to change. That's why I highlighted it in green. This is very much in flux. I know that Lenny and Neil have been working on some language. Um, so the hope is that we'll have section two for you to look at shortly. But this is where you're moving money around to go to town highway aid and taking it away from the toll fees. I expect this to change quite a bit. Okay, okay. back to section one for a second. Um, are there any concerns, questions, or opposition to section one? I, I think just giving history for the committee, th this is one that usually we don't ever even talk about. And so, because um, we talk, that's what the whole bill is, is to adjust what is in the white book. So this is saying that the white book stands except for what we change. And, and I was the one that had the heartburn that the white book wasn't correct and we kept being told it wasn't correct. So I couldn't accept it. So this is marvelous because it says yeah. it's now the revised edition and now this is what we're kicking off of. So I hope that everybody's good with section one. Yep. I know why certainly yeah. 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 Yes. Is this the kind of section where we would vote on it last because it, in case there's changes that come up or? It actually is one we've always just sort of acknowledged that I'm bothered voting on it in an essence because it, in the end, when we vote the whole bill, it's, it's what we vote. Okay. Because all the others change. Every, it, anything yes. we do from section two forward changes what section one says. Exactly. So okay. So it's I hear what you're saying. And we're adding the date because that's when it was fixed. That's when we received the fix. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Good. So let's put a check on that one. That's the job. The one on the top. Oh, yeah. Yep. Do you have any intention of uh, amending the town highway aid formula to explain exactly how it's supposed to work? We have a small amendment yeah, of yeah. just adding sidewalks. And he was talking, talking about, about the clear no, 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 no. yeah. Much like you're doing with Central Garage. Um, I would say not before we get the jingle out if we want to get any cross. Yeah, I, I haven't heard that right. right. anybody wants to do that. Okay. No, he's presented it before. It was a technical thing. It was about when do you start that formula. It wasn't clear the way it was 
we passed the last year. He was saying he wants to make it clear it goes from the previous to It's also years. unclear exactly how it's supposed to work. In terms of the CPI? Yeah, to the no, further. In terms of what's included and what's excluded. Do you think we ought to do that? Yes. Okay. Um, please bring it up. With this, um, what section would we do that? Would we you do it anywhere? Where we want logical to do it related to where where you're changing the money. And yep. we're, also, okay. we're adding in section 10A, which is adding in the sidewalks yep. word. So that would be you're already amending yep. 306, 19 BSA 306, which is the yeah. formula. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Oh, there's no language here, just this. Right. Okay. That, that was the only change that we had talked about, but um, thank you, Neil. Let's, um, when we get to that section, hopefully Neil will, will be with us and we'll hear from him while we are here. Um, so this is in response to the conversation that you had yesterday. I have it as a separate handout. It's posted in the same place where version 4.1 is. It's now up on the screen, and this is where you're adding the word and sidewalks after bicycle routes. But the formula that Neil is talking about is earlier on in 19 BSA section 306. I slotted it in at 10A because that's sort of the end of the, we're changing things from, for this year, but we certainly can put it in another place in the bill if you think it would flow better. Okay, so I, I am sorry. No, I, just, I didn't realize you know, section one. It is posted and, to the committee page. Okay. okay. Maddie's nodding her head. Okay. Um, if but it's not in the 4.1 version. Correct. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing a page. Until I'm told otherwise, I'm going to do things as the handouts. Yeah. So that's why you had a handout from Michelle for the rail okay. commuter study and why you're having a handout for the okay. change you made yesterday. Was kind of highlighting. Yeah, the second part of this would be uh, a section just like this as proposed as amended, which would be program development in which um, you're reducing uh, T funds by whatever amount you want to do, and adding federal funds. And that's all you need to do. And whoever has it on the floor, I would avoid mentioning toll credits. <laughs> all, 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 all you have to say is that the agency found some lower match requirements. Yeah. Which freed up some T funds. And some people might think we're well, suggesting a toll road. Yes. Yeah, it. it. It's always a nightmare whenever toll credits come on. <laughs> I thought it was a, a good dream. <laughs> okay, so. So I will work with Neil and we'll get you new language to go with the green language. Yes. Tim, that sounds good. Yeah, no, I'm fine. Okay. What about the, um, I think Wendy said the toll credits were like 834000 Something like that. Are you still working on? Well, we're going to do the 723, you know, the formula base, and then yeah. we're trying to get some money for the down. We want to increase the amount. Uh, let's, 723. Let's, let's try to tell you this, uh, Michelle. As, as Tim pointed out yesterday, with um, many towns, a little more than we need to stick with the formula on town highways. So let's try to do ultimately 800,000 for sidewalks. 421 has already been transferred, so it's 800 minus 421. If, it's, the downtown fund. No. Oh, okay. So the transfer that went to the downtown transportation and yeah. related capital improvement fund was 423,966 yes. in the big bill. So the difference, if you want to make that whole pot be 800,000, would be 376,034. Okay, so Michelle, if you need tool and change, 275,000. Because you got extra. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What are you doing with the transfer to the? Nothing. Nothing. You agree that you agree with the agency's recommendation <coughs> on that transfer. It's a transfer of four hundred some thousand dollars to the downtown 
designated downtown. Yeah, that doesn't even appear in your Chiba. Yeah. Right, it's in the right. 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 So, so, right. so what are you talking about now? Yeah. Yeah. Making the 800 volt? That's the same pot. No. She used the word pot. It's not the same pot. It's not going to the same place. Right. Oh, okay. That's, that's one pot. And we've agreed with the administration on that exact amount. And then also agreeing with the Heart Association, I was trying to get more. They, they recommended bringing that uh, number to 800,000, which is that, exactly what it used to be. The committee did not agree with that because some committee members didn't want to have too much money going to designated town towns versus other towns. So we discovered that if we do with the, um, we also want to uh, not hold, not the, uh, but not uh, notwithstand, not want to notwithstand the language, uh, we're calling it Connie's language, the formula for the CPI increase uh, for the town highway program. And then we talked about uh, the same kind of thing, at least the same day we talked about trying to get more money for sidewalks, at least get to that 800000 with what was already been transferred and then another program because they didn't want to use that, that first program, that transfer to the designated downtowns. But yet, I think a strong majority, perhaps everybody, did support trying to get some more money for sidewalks mm -hmm. and how, how to do that, where to do that. We talked about the bike lane program, and then we talked about why not do it right in town. Oh, because Connie pointed out she has no sidewalks at all in her whole district, not even in her well, village yes, of Concord, yes, which she doesn't even have I was thinking Concord yes. must. <laughs> so it does. All right. You were exaggerating. And they might want yes. a sidewalk. I, you know, I was thinking that your village where you live probably has a sidewalk, so apparently it does. But anyway, she's, she's got bigger problems than sidewalks. And um, so what seemed like a great solution was can, can a town use some of the town highway money that they, that they get for sidewalks if they choose to. And the answer was, and she actually thinks they can. I think Michelle said she thought they could. We're making it real clear by putting it in the law, just sidewalks is added to the list of things that the town can spend that money on. So I'm just asking Michelle to find the money to get us to that 800 Well, no, it's more money. Yeah. Well, it's where? Are you, are you talking about town highway going to 1.1 instead of 700,000? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. My head was about to explode. Yeah. 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 So you're just increasing the town highway by 1.1 million. Yeah. And that, that gets us to the number of sidewalks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
maybe understand that feeling, but I think it's important that Connie understand that we defended her in her absence. I think we've all had similar feelings, regardless of what can be <laughs> uh, Mike? I just wanted to say, uh, Mr. Chair, that I really appreciated your pushback against some of the adjectives that were used yesterday, especially the word irresponsible in describing our even considering uh, increasing town highway aid and you're kind of defending the role that this committee has in setting priorities is that was tense I think is a diplomatic description of the discussion that we had yesterday so I really appreciate you basically sticking up for the house transportation committee <laughs> because that was a that was a really weird conversation I haven't really seen anything quite like that in the time that I've been here. Mom. And, and I, I want to give credit to Tim for, for really like sort of just drilling down and, and looking and, and persisting. And I, I think, you know, again, I think all of us, and this is where we might run in trouble with the Senate, we are close to our towns. And we feel that, you know, we're here doing state business, but our towns are, we're representing our towns. And that's what we're here to do in, in part. about that. That's something we can all agree on, too. I just want to compound what Molly said, because it's, and when we say our towns, it's like, we think of all of the towns. I, I really have felt, yeah, we aren't just here advocating. We might use our town as an That's example, yeah. but we really do speak to it as all the municipalities, yeah. that it's that level that we're looking at, rather than just where we came from. Yeah. But there is that kind of good old-fashioned pure representation, right? That really the dynamic between say Connie and me. I, I probably represent the most urban district in the state. And probably. yours sounds like it might be the most rural. Certainly one. I really want to say it. All probably is. So, you know, if people didn't notice, uh, you would, why would you notice? Uh, so, yes, it's, it might be odd that I don't have a car and I chair this committee, but 32% uh, of the households in my district have no vote. So we do represent very different districts. And from that, of, what? of the households, not just the people, but the households in my district have no vote. What percentage? 32. It's actually 31.5. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> And that's as of the last census. If you guys didn't notice, the Census Bureau has data right down to state legislative districts. It's incredible. Really? And that's where I got that. And I got some oh. other things in there. They don't have everything broken down uh, by district, but they have a lot. A lot on transportation. Huh. Very interesting. Yeah. And in my district, it's a necessity to have a problem. Right. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's an awful long walk or bike ride. I understand, <laughs> that, I understand that your husband comes on the bus from St. Jay. He does. From St. Jay. Yeah. Well, that's different. I mean, you got to get to St. Jay. Jay. <laughs> but I think it's great that he does that. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of friends that talk about it, and they don't do it. They would drive all the way here from the film. It's not the most pleasant ride. The, the bus or the or the, bus. Or the, the bus? Well, to, they have all the equipment. I've ridden it once. I thought it was great. It reminded me of being in so a poor was. country. A poor <laughs> country. <laughs> well, well, the transit is unbelievably efficient, and there's no rules about how many people can fit in or on the vehicle. Or Attached to. <laughs> and what they can take with them. <laughs> My daughter got bit by uh, a chicken the first time I took her on a bus in Guatemala. I know this paper is incredible. <laughs> Okay. So section two, I think yes, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, conceptually, I think we're fine with it. We just have to fill in the details of how that money all shakes out or whatever. But, uh, yes. You know, well, actually, if everybody agrees with what Neil was saying. I think that it's going to be a big discussion because that's what we fought for. That's, oh, that's, that's Connie's language. Okay, that's right. what that is. It's it's the fourth. Well, I think it's a I mean, I'm looking at it as more of a technical correction. I mean, we're just well, being more specific of what we yes. wanted to do. But so, we'll, we'll, we won't take the one. We'll yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll we, have we need to see the formula. Yeah. 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 Yes. So you're trying to make it more clear. Like when 2B comes out? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. 
Because the well, depending on how much that tree gets shaped from the other two seventy-five. We, so I guess that's a to be determined. I was expecting that, depending on how much money could be found, it's possible that both two A and two B would come out. The additional money for sidewalks would be in section two, and then Neil and Lenny are going to come up with how to do the, the transfer. Um, and that would be 2A. If Lenny and the Agency of Transportation can't find additional money, then that's when you would have the conversation about whether or not you would want to pull it from the maintenance part. Yeah. yeah, so it's almost a two week term when you have to wait to see what we're offering. Yeah. And by the way, I did speak to Karen uh, Horn this morning. Oh, good. Somebody asked me to do that. Yes, and, thank um, you. Uh, she's quite happy. You know, this is nowhere near as much money as four cents in the caps, actually. Well, how about the sidewalk? Yeah. Sidewalk. You asked for the sidewalk. Price. Price. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, no, not the money, but the length, the change. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, she, she okay. liked it all. Okay. Okay. So section three, nothing much has changed since version 3.1, except on page four, the highlighted language. You now have it in there. Um, upon the request or concurrence of the municipality made through a motion or resolution adopted by the legislative body, and this was so that there's something that the state can point to saying, yes, they really truly did want to cancel this. And then you're also requiring that notice of the cancellation be included in the agency's annual proposed transportation program. It's a tad more work for the agency, but Michelle, I believe you guys are in agreement with this. Well, I guess um, it just feels like more of a paperwork shuffle. I think we would, given the language, and, and we talked about this offline after um, this was presented, um, just doing it like we do it now, where we just put it in, you know, the book and we defend it. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of six one half dozen the other. Um, so rather than trying to track down and find all those, you know papers and get them into the book at the right time in the right place. Um, I think given the option, we'd probably rather just maintain the status quo, which is that we put the canceled projects in and we defend them before you at the time of okay. cancellation. Make a motion to delete section three. Okay, so to leave the whole section, yeah. do you want to just take out this or do you well, no, they were saying that, that we, we went overboard on the recommendation, so it would be all section three, and then they would just do the following one like they did in sections uh, uh, you know, five and six. That's right, so you guys never did recommend section three at all. Yeah, they did, but without the yellow light. Yeah, yeah, without the yellow light. So you're only talking about five, five, yes. That's what you're moving to take out? No, I'm moving to take in section, oh, section 3 out oh, okay. and just have it in the status quo. Because I would want this and they don't want that, so if, I, I, I so just take it all out. Because it's too cumbersome on them. They, they just want the standard process. And Michelle's nodding her head yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually haven't heard of the problem. No. No, I mean, we just brought it forth thinking it would simplify things yeah. because we're not going to cancel a project that the municipality has requested you know unless a municipality has requested us and I think we got into quite a discussion about who's the municipality did the select board approve it we're not going to do it without the select board you wanted documentation it's like well we'll just if something comes up we'll just come in and cancel it we don't have to remember and maybe chase down a letter and get it in the right place at the right time we'll just bring in the testimony okay um, so there's been a motion that section three come out Entirely. Um, discussion. Connie, you you were at Town Burke. What do you think? And Patty was. They don't cancel it unless they talk to the municipality. Yeah. I'm sure. I think you should probably cancel the in the first place. Well, well I, I think that the concern and why we put in this language was that. That's well and good, but we've accepted projects, and we won't know they aren't there. As, as this committee's oversight ends up incomplete, and that's why we were saying you can do it without 
the General Assembly's approval as long as you fill this in. And, and so if that part is difficult, then leave it the way it is. And, and so I'm with Tim that it, if it's difficult to figure out how to make sure we're informed, then just leave it the way it is, because right now it works. Because they need our approval to do it, and they still, they cancel it. I mean, basically it gets canceled, but it's in the book to let us know it's been canceled. So if that's working, then leave it. Yes. And, and forget all the change. But the one thing I did want to ask is, there was also a change in um, Joint Physical Committee when General Assembly is not in session. So there was language about when we're not in session that might still be wanted, um, Tim. So really oh, the piece yeah. that, that we argued about was that, except that the agency may cancel a municipal project. It's like, um, you know, that was the part we were arguing might not fully fit all of our needs. But I don't know that we had any issue with when we're not in session clarifying who gets told. And yeah, maybe no, that's all part of, of I don't know. Question. Again, Michelle, or at the end. You want to change your motion? Yeah, no, I, well, I'll listen to them. Yeah, I didn't think that was, I mean, it was more of a technical right. minor point. It doesn't really matter to me either way. So to provide some yeah. clarity, um, I believe, and Michelle and I sort of have to go back to what the original version that was sent over from the agency. The only thing they wanted added was on line 14 to 19, right. except that the agency may cancel a municipal project. When I was going through this, and when the trapping ops was going through this, there was just some cleanup to make things more consistent. And then I believe that's what Michelle just spoke to about them being kind of done. So if you want to maintain the status quo in terms of things like this sort of language being in the T-bill for project cancellations, but you want to have that consistency with reporting, which it sounds like the agency is fine with, you would keep everything that you have before you in section three now, except you would delete on line 14 where it says except to the end of the highlighted, you would just put the period back after general assembly. Can you say that one more time? So you would put a period at the end of assembly and then get rid of that sentence till it's not, till the highlight? So you would put the period back here. This period was always there. Everything in here, that's new language. Yep. This is new language that the agency wanted, and this was what you said. Okay, we're okay with that if yellow. So you'd okay. be taking out what they wanted and what you wanted. Oh, okay. I understand that. Thank you. Are we? Why are we meeting in section three? Everything else that is there. The joint fiscal. Yeah. That sounds perfect. Yeah. <laughs> that's your that's yeah, motion. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Any more discussion? So the motion is to just get rid of section three. No, no, no they got so amended. <laughs> the motion is to approve section three. Just with the whole uh, okay. uh, South of line 14. <laughs> Up to the period after general assembly. Yeah, after general assembly. Line I wish I could like, delete yeah. stuff yeah. on the screen. <laughs> I don't think technology is very important. Not to sell any north of. Not to sell any yeah, Maddie, work on that. <laughs> okay, uh, let's just do a show of hands and in favor. Great, thank you. Section four. More on So these are the specific project cancellations. There are two of them. And nothing has changed about this since what the agency brought forward. Section four or five, I move to approve. Okay. Section five is part of the condition. Yeah, they're just. Uh, According to Maddie's notes, you already had signed off on the okay. condition. Chris, oh, great. It's remain signed off. Okay, then. Four and five. Mm -hmm. Really, you are a great committee assistant. I don't want to do that, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so six. Okay, so section six and section seven, you heard testimony about this yesterday. The comment that I had, um, that I had raised with you last week was, I didn't understand why we were notwithstanding the acceptance of grant language when it, in version 3.1 didn't actually say that you were then accepting the grant. 
So we're now making it clear in both Section 6 and Section 7 that a grant is being accepted. In Section 6, there's going to be that change on line 7 to make it 20 million, not 2 million. <laughs> and then the reason why in Section 7, and I think Lenny provided testimony on this yesterday, you're actually adding something, adding a project, is because there is a project to be added. Whereas for the 20 million grant acceptance, there isn't a specific project to be added yet. We just want to refresh our memory on notwithstanding 32 BSA or but just yes. what are we now standing? So that's the general language about the process that needs to happen for um, an agency what I want, for an agency to accept a grant, and I will bring that up. I just wonder what we're now standing. Why are we saying that we're not understanding this language for this grant only? But why don't I see the grant number or something about it? Like it's not even the grant, it's a grant, except a the. And because there's only that grant to be accepted. Well, if that, if that, that's the acronym for Bill. Bill is the new, the new uh, tire federal grant program is there's, there's, you could be going for another one in which case you would need to either the agency of transportation would need to follow 32 bsa section 5 or at some point in the future you would need to not withstand you're not giving them blanket authority to go around accepting grants it seems to me we are if it's a bill grant but it's a 20 million dollar bill grant that they've already been given you but why can't we put the, that grant number in or something is there a grant number that could be placed? The name of that grant, that, that particular grant. Uh, you know what yeah, I'm saying, Michelle? Yeah, we could um, find a number or something for you. I think, I think otherwise we're saying you don't need to do this every time you go for a, a uh, No, but it's in the, the amount of $20 million that they've already come forward. It's a specific grant award. You're not saying they can always accept build grants in the, the plural sense, well, we certainly can provide more clarity. We can certainly put in a specific grant number. I would suggest if you're going to do it in Section 6, you do the same thing in Section 7 yep. as well so that there's clarity there. So we would need grant numbers for, for both of them. Sure. So Section 7 already has an identifier, which is the project number in the book. And I think the trouble with Section 6 is it's not in the book yet, so we don't have an identifier. So I, I guess... I mean, I can give you a grant number. I guess I don't want to, I'm not sure if we want to get into the, um, do we want to get into the process of including grant numbers in the bill as well as project numbers, or do we just want to include a grant number if a project number is not available? In other words, do we need two identifiers or just one? I think, well, for my, I'm sorry. go ahead. For, for my comfort level, I. I'm more concerned that we're saying we'll accept a grant, which is a lovely thing to get, except it means we will be allocating state monies. So I think that that's all met by what this language proposes, because it's capped at accepting the 20 million, which we had a big discussion yesterday about how much commitment from state monies that ends up being. Right. And so that's the part for me that matters for the bill. And the book next year will obviously, once it's in it, have, it'll have a project number and it'll 
to be in that pile. Okay. I think we should trust our lawyer because we're paying her a lot of money. <laughs> I think the way that you're reading, the way that section six is drafted is it's A, better utilizing investment grant in the amount of 20 million. That is the grant that's been identified by its monetary amount. However, I think if you wanted to sort of have a belt and suspenders approach, which we do all the time, identify it in a more drilled down way, you certainly could, but if you're going to drill down in section six by saying it's its grant award number and then in section seven where you're also saying it's got this project number that exists now i think that there could be a little bit of confusion there you want to be consistent when you're adding something somewhere so getting back to my question why are we not withstanding if the governor can accept it why do we need to accept why would they not withstand language from the governor accepting I think that this would be a question for the agency oh. as to what their normal procedure is. When well, they no, they do do it. I don't know if I really asked, you know, we just, I mean, I don't have a problem with it, but if the governor can sign off on it, why do we need to sign off on it? Why would we not stand for stand the governor, I guess? I don't know. Did I read too much into that? No. Well, we're doing us, too. The second one, the 19 VSA 7, that's us. Well, I mean, we're us. not withstanding two chapters. Yeah, no, well, we can't be, yeah, why are we not withstanding that? Because we are approving it now, so we're not, we're well, not withstanding this, it. The, what the secretary needs to do. I'll pull that one up oh, okay. as well. So I guess I, I just don't understand why we're doing that with standing I think this would be a question for the agency yeah. of transportation yeah. as to why maybe this grant is different or what they normally do with acceptance of grants, and I don't have any sort of institutional knowledge. And then find out from Lenny. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I mean, I appreciate the courtesy of Lenny, so no, but. Uh, so what do we normally do for grant acceptance when the legislature's not in session? Well, I mean, the, no, the notwithstanding 32 VSA, it sounds like the governor has the authority to accept a grant. So why, is that correct or a, a thing or no? Yeah. So why are we notwithstanding your boss? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, we're I'm well, sure I told you my first response is we're jumping the governor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, Michelle, if we could have again, why do you mean this? Yeah. But that's just a minor point. I would see six and seven are, are fine. I'm just. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then I think you know my concern. Yeah. You can do something about that. So I, I need marching orders. Am I? Uh, OK, well, when you, you mentioned the word A, and I, I just don't see that word the same as you are. I'm saying that that word A is, is my problem. Because uh, it, it, that sounds in general like it's not a particular if, it's, if the word the is in there, and maybe a date, the grant that, you know, so, so we, we know we're talking about only that grant. And I'm happy to add in that language. I just need information yeah. to fill in the blanks. No, but I thought you needed more marching orders from me. Right. I need marching orders from you because it's your bill. And if your marching orders or you want to change this language, yeah. I need information from the agency okay. as to what goes in there. But you just said something that I think is really a simple fix and that would really, I think, from what you're saying, change bring that clarity. Good. It's take out A in both set six and seven and put in the. Yeah, to accept the consolidated rail infrastructure and to accept the better utilizing investment grant in the amount of. I, I, I don't think that changes the intent of what it is, and I think it no, does, like all. you say, specify you, yeah. that one. That's, the irony is that you thought, in your mind, the word uh no, does I, that. But I, I think uh <laughs> coupled with 20 million is clarified what grant it is. Where I would have a concern is if it said to accept better utilizing investment to leverage development bill grants. Right. Or I would also have a concern if it said grants up to. Yeah. But I think that based on the fact that this is a grant for $20 million, we don't get grants for exactly $20 million all the time that are bill grants, that you have identified it. But you can identify it you know, in any number of ways you could identify it, by its date, by its grant application yeah. number, by its grant award number. I say take out any put in that. Okay. So those are my two letters? Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm not sure it's good enough, but. Uh, or just say bill grant of 2019, because we already got it, we received it, we know yeah. it's this year. Something like that. Just put so it on. I think we bill. got it in 20. 
I guess it was fiscal year 2019. Whatever the date is, so say on the bill grant of 2019. I'll get an agenda higher. More than the senator. Somewhere in that <laughs> range. Okay. 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 Anything else on those two? Okay. We know it's about the financial interest. All right. Section. Section eight. Okay. So this used to be. This used to be that um, handout that you had that was section 19, 19A, and 19B. Um, and this is where you're saying to the Agency of Transportation, okay, you can spend less money on Central Garage this year, but we're still going to calculate the formula for the next year as if you had spent the amount you were supposed to this year. It resets the point that the CPI gets figured from. Yeah, and the number is the right number. Word for okay, pages. This, this number came from, from Neil, uh, and I think Lenny has testified to it, and the Agency of Transportation has testified okay. It was, I believe, the number that would have, yes, we had material on that. All right, does anybody have a, a problem with that? Just three seconds. Okay, so section eight is adopted. Section nine? Did we adopt six and seven? No, not quite. Okay. Very close. <laughs> section nine. Barbara, you can have one century of the launch. And what was the thirty nine thousand for? We just went up right yesterday. That was the internal service funding. I think it's just an update. And I think it just, there was an error in that graph or something. Yeah, I remember you. There was a mention of it. That in the 2020, the um, authorized spending for operating yeah, expenses, was the error. reduction, it was just an, it was an error. Of, there you go. Now. Yeah. And it was the 39,000. It was. OK. Do we have a problem with that? OK. Of when you're working as a committee to build a bill, you right. know, things get stuck on the end. Session 11. So nothing has changed here since the prior version. I had as an outstanding question that Maddie had emailed me about on what would happen if section 11 was deleted. So by way of just a refresher, section 11 is where the Agency of Transportation is saying we really were supposed to have repealed all of one, or sorry, all of little i, whereas only part of it was repealed, subdivision one, where it says repealed. So they have come in and said, delete all the rest of it, and they've told you about how it is that they're already calculating the formula for public transit funding. So currently they are acknowledging that they are not complying with what the statute says, and they would like the statute codified the law to be silent on public transit funding formula. If you take out section 11, you're keeping what is in the green books, what is in codified law, what the Agency of Transportation is supposed to be following and what they've said they're not following. If you keep Section 11 in, then codified law is silent on this formula and you sort of leave to the executive branch of the government to fill in the details as they've explained to you they're doing. We kept Section 11 in here as sort of a placeholder because you'd ask them to come back with some sort of different proposal for how they were going to calculate public transit funding, and I don't think I was here when they came back to talk about that, so I don't know what has been provided to you. And you still have an open agency proposal to come. 
And I think that also it was um, like that error, the fact that it wasn't repealed when the first part was, was done in 2003. So it's not as if it's something that we changed last year and we just didn't catch it. And so I, my understanding on this was we were not going to take the action that's been passed and we were just going to have a deeper conversation. And again, kind of going back to Tim's idea of status quo, letting, not taking this action until we know what we're replacing it with specifically. Because this is a very specific formula. And it really speaks to populations that have requested the existing models. Yeah. Michelle, what was the? I know we've actually gone around this a few times, but um, uh, it does say that you shall do this, and I guess you're not. <laughs> yeah, and and I think we are not because our understanding was that in 2003 this had been repealed, and we never really went back to clarify that the language was revealed correctly, which apparently wasn't. So we moved on to the new plan, which never was codified in statute at this time. Uh, and so um, that's why we're not following statute. We, we came across this error. We realized it was in there. We're you know, seeking to have it corrected. Um, and I had thought the committee was going to ask Barbara to come in the week before last with proposed new language. Apparently that didn't happen. So I guess, do you want her to come in and propose new language? If, if that's possible, this week, yeah. Yeah, uh, let me see what I can do about getting okay. her here either this Great. afternoon or tomorrow morning. Great. Great. Thank you. And I feel really bad because she's quite obviously quite ill. So <laughs> she is not using that as an excuse if she's unable to be with us. It was pretty extraordinary that she was here this morning, I think. Who is this? Barbara. Oh. Um, yeah, and I actually, I thought maybe we had done that. I don't think you were comfortable with just repealing what's in there. And, uh, this is 3.1. And that never happened. Because I mean, I think that's what's being said is we've been doing something for 16 years, 15 years anyway. So just, you know, let us correct it by codifying what we're doing well, rather than just removing what we were telling it should be being done. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. All right, so section 12. So this is, um, again, we've got a bunch to put together. 12, 13, and 14 are all on condemnation. I have as a follow-up question here um, from Representative McCoy um, asking me to look into what is required to be filed when the Agency of Transportation condemns. Um, if it's okay with the committee, if we could bring this up after lunch, um, I think just because that was something that she had been interested in. And I do have some additional statutory research that I can point to on that. Fifteen is the definition for PP3, and sixteen is the highway work minimum wages. I have, based on Maddie's notes, that these are both things that the committee had um, signed off on. Yeah. As uh, why do we jump over to fifteen? Uh, uh, it was twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Well, it really only re it relates to the general concept of the condemnation. Um, so I'm sort of lumping them together in my mind. Okay. Yes. It, what I'm going to present back might not even change any of the language. Okay, that's fine. I just didn't realize it, her, her language was in three sections. Okay. Section 15. So section 17, this is what you heard testimony on from the Vermont State Police yesterday. Yes, right the that was the PP3 and the highway work minimum wage is 16. I have that those are um, sections that the committee had already voted on for Maddie's notes. Okay, 15 and 16? Yes. They were more technical corrections to yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I'm just thinking of the Okay, now we're on 17. Okay, great. So this is um, the junior operator used portable electronic devices. This is what you had um, copied from the senior operator. Yeah. So this is the piece that had the two yes. questions. 
Okay, you're on. <laughs> Woo, there we go. Right before lunch. Sorry, uh, take a break. So, <laughs> lunch break. I asked two questions on this section yesterday um, that we're getting responses from Michelle. She sent me an email back. Uh, my two questions were, would the increased penalty, uh, both financial endpoints, deter officers from issuing tickets to junior operators? The response was, this would not deter our officers as they have discretion to issue a violation or a warning at the roadside. The same discretion is used for adult operators. So I could live about that piece. Uh, then the other question I had was, since there is a higher penalty and fee, or not a higher fee, but a higher penalty for school zones, um, if that would change the way that enforcement was done by officers, because typically the drivers that are in those areas are junior drivers. Um, and they responded with, uh, the VSP is a data. VSP is a data driven. Is data driven. What's the VSP? That Vermont is. State yeah. Vermont State, Vermont State Police. So Vermont State Police is data driven about our enforcement, and when data points to areas of concern, aka crash data, speed data, or impaired driving, they focus those efforts there. Um, and at times, that there are areas of concern in school zones, the officers understand the hazards associated with using portable electronic devices in school and work zones due to high pedestrian traffic and the probability of serious death or injury if an operator is not vigilant in those areas. So, long story short, the schools will not be targeted simply because the penalties have been increased. They'll use the data that they've always used. So, I feel good about both of those questions, and I'm happy to. My questions have been answered. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave. Uh, I thought about this last night some, and uh, in my mind, yesterday my head was kind of swirling trying to follow the discussion around this. And in my mind, there's sort of two areas of statute here. There's one that's in our bill that talks about kind of making the same, making it clear the same expectations for youth are consistent with what is expected of adults. And that's what's in this bill. And then the discussion got wrapped into what's already in statute around how we treat uh, youthful drivers. And that statute was put in place before any of us on this committee uh, had anything to do with it. It's been there a long time. And then I got thinking about, well, why is it that we treat youth differently than adults? And that's an important question that goes to the fundamental discussion yesterday. And I thought about that, and then I, I thought about insurance. And so does young people pay the same insurance rate as middle-aged people do? And the answer to that is no, they don't. And so the discussion yesterday would would, would say, well, maybe that's unfair because they are being treated the same. So you ask, well, why is their insurance rate higher? And it's higher because they uh, are a lot more apt to have collisions, a lot more apt to violate the law. And you know, I could make a long list of things like they have no fear, uh, they. They don't listen well. You know, I could make a long list of those from my experience as a teacher with young people. But they are more risky, and that's why they pay a greater insurance rate. And that's why they're treated differently under statute long to set by people a long time before us, is because they're more risky. And we don't want to have them on the road if they've committed a violation that indicates they're tending to be more risky, we're saying the people previously that set that in statute are saying we're shutting them off. And, you know, it's really not a lot to do with what's here. What's here is just making a proportionality to what we expect from adults. And we're, as a driver and teacher, I would be able to say the same thing to kids. We expect, these are high risk areas. We don't want you texting in these areas. And the other thing I thought about is kids text a lot now. They don't just call on the phone. They do texting more than they do calling. And that's an added risk. And then I'll add one other thing that I've added that I've said many times in the seatbelt debate. If you catch a kid 
that's doing texting and they get stopped and they get punished by whatever is in statute here, you've done that kid a favor. You haven't hurt that kid. You've done them a favor because they're not as apt to kill themselves or somebody else and have a lawsuit uh, facing them maybe if they've hurt somebody or killed somebody. I would argue you've done them a favor if they change their behavior. It's well worth the fine and the few points they get if they've changed their. The same thing applies to seatbelts. Stop somebody with a seatbelt violation, you've done them a favor if they change their behavior. Oh. Shut up now. Rebuttal? <laughs> Dave, man, I, I know what you're saying, but you can't separate those two. I mean, you just can't. If you're trying to do it, but the actuality, you do have a 10-day suspension, you have a 90-day suspension, you have six points as opposed to 10. I know you're saying it's a different argument, but it's not a different argument because we're changing those points, and those have direct effects on those kids. And the insurance, it could be a major headache, you know, for those kids. I mean, do we want to, I mean, we're already punishing by those things that I just mentioned already. Now, we're, in my opinion, we're just dropping the, the hammer on them. And I just don't agree with that. And you, you come up with these stats that these kids are texting. I'm not disagreeing, but adults are too. Maybe we should have a 90 day suspension for a driver's license if we want to be fair. Yeah, maybe we, we should do that. Why, well, why do we have 10? Why, do we, why are we special? The statistics say we're not as apt. We haven't heard Based that from the, the law enforcement that they issue well, their tickets for, you're, you're, for these points. You're hearing it from the insurance people because you know that. You know that we, they We didn't hear, hear, we we hear any testimony reason. from law enforcement saying that the kids are they're so out of control texting that we need to increase these. We haven't heard it. We just yeah, did we, this. We, we just heard it did. loud and clear. And she just heard it in what was responded. The, the state police testified, Michelle testified that they're supportive of this change. Supportive and having facts are two different things, Dave. Supportive two different life. things. I could be supportive of anything and not have the facts to back it up. But anyway, this one's time. Well, I look at it as a <laughs> When you first get a driver's license, you're on probation. Well, that's so true. When, and when an adult gets a job yeah. at the state government, was, is it one year, Michelle, or, was, or, or, or half a year that you're on probation? Uh, six months. Six months. So during that six months, you do not have the job protection and, and some other protection. You, you can't that, use a driver. You can't use a junior operator's license in the course of employment. It's against the law. It's written into law. You can't drive truck on a junior operator's license. For a living. Well, um, are we ready to vote on this section? Or? Well, I don't have a vote. Well, I mean, I don't need more testimony, but I, why don't we hold it open? Because we know Patty wants to be a part of the vote. It's okay. already after 12. And that really challenged the election. Yeah, that's right now. That's right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do that. They're working on it. Yes, it'll catch your breath. It's still wild. Yeah, I know. Um, we have left off in the middle of a discussion on section 17, and I was planning on circling back to the condemnation piece. But it doesn't seem like we still don't know why it's here yet. Um, I can do a little update on things that have been posted to the committee page since you adjourned for lunch. That'd be helpful? Uh, yeah, as long as it's in this bill. It is, if you put it in. <laughs> um, so you heard uh, testimony from Neil this morning about a possible revision to the town highway aid formula. So that is now posted to your committee page. Is that has been put into uh, yeah, so 4.1? Nothing is getting put into 4.1 until you tell me to do 5.1. I'm just going to continue doing these as okay. these handouts until I am told combine it. What should we click on? You should click on the second from the bottom, addition on town highway aid version two. Okay. So this is the same language that you saw this morning in 306 AE where you're adding the word and sidewalks or the words and sidewalks. 
but Neil and Lenny have worked on a slight revision up in the top of this section dealing with the formula and its year-over-year -year increase in the two most recently closed fiscal years as opposed to in the previous fiscal year. And I think they probably can tell you a lot more about the logistics of that than I will ever do. It was here. He's texting somebody, I think. Yeah. Thank you. No. This is the thing where we're, if we use the previous one and it's not closed, we can't actually make a budget based on that? Are you remembering this? Yes. Now? Okay. Yeah, it's just a clarification of what we attended last year. And it works right now? Yes. It gives a solid figure to look at rather than trying to guess. We hit we have all the numbers. So. Yeah. Was what we had previous, what was the previous language is actually impossible to do? Technically, yes. But not again. <laughs> and you're trying to trust the legislation. Well, then I have to say, I think maybe we heard that last year, but we were adamant we didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be fair. <laughs> okay, that. Sidewalks. So this is. Um, the, this would be a revision, this would be a new slot in for section 10A. I'm not going to talk about, or there's nothing to update you on. Oh, when you said end sidewalks, you mean the addition of sidewalks. I thought you were talking about money for sidewalks. Yes, so. No, I just meant the, those words. Okay, because they're yes. they're still looking for the money. Line 17. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the other thing that's newly posted is a revised central garage formula. Oh, hold on. Before we leave this, or this is, is this this is not in the central garage section. No, what do you? This would be a new section on this town is, highway. This is section 10A. Yes. Okay. So does anybody? One more page, and you'll see where it's at. Yeah. No, oh. I've seen it all. Okay. Um, before we leave this, any uh, may agree with this? Any objections or any concerns? Okay. So let's check that one. Would this be like in section 2A or 3? Or? So you have to renumber it. It'll I'm just saying it to make the bill throw a flow. So the way I have it laid out is you've got the things where you're changing stuff. You're telling them you're modifying the okay. transportation program. You're adding projects. You're canceling yeah. projects. You're accepting grants. And then I'm having after that the stuff where you're actually like starting to modify the statutes okay, or sense, yes. ongoing things. Yeah. So this will be the second of the we're changing stuff going forward. Yeah. It'll come after the uh, formula for Central Garage. So I'm going to put a check next to 10A. Yep. Okay. Okay, now. The next handout will be one above this revised central garage formula. This was something you checked off this morning, but but uh, Neil and Lenny have also suggested doing that same revision to most recently closed state fiscal years down at line 10. Then we see that. Line 10. Oh, same, it's a one pager. Line 10. No, I, I must be on the wrong document. Yeah. Try going back to your document. Page. If you go back to the document page, it's the third from the bottom. Yeah. Revised central garage formula. Everybody good with that? No objections? Okay. So that is, that's 10. And um, now, I should go back to documents. Mm -hmm. And there's one more new thing that's posted since this morning. The transit thing? The transit puppet. So what up from that? Yeah. You have that in? Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. And I got barbecue. Your entire program criteria 
Uh, and over lunch, all right. Well, let's see it. Testimony to the fact that they've been doing it for 15 years. <laughs> yeah, so this is, okay, that's what you're you codifying what you've been doing. So this was language that the agency provided that I just rearranged a little bit. Um, there are some things in here that I have questions about. I, you know, was given this an hour ago. I have spent very little time with it. Um, I'd be curious to know what these federal requirements are that they're saying that they meet. Um, I would be curious to know who can apply for these programs and say this grant money, it says applications may be accepted for regional services. I don't know if they're trying to say that multiple municipalities can combine together for projects, if it needs to be like a regional authority. Um, and then when they're using the criteria, this is lines 8 to 12, saying how funds will be distributed. I just don't know what a lot of this means, and maybe it's something that you do because you've heard more testimony on it. Um, but I think that you know maybe there can be some revisions to this language to sort of clarify it. You're going from a very, very regimented formula right, yeah. to something that's more things that are important to public transit are what we'll consider when we're giving money to public transit projects. Happy to relinquish my seat to people who know more about funding public transit projects. And Barbara's here. Yeah. Uh, Michelle or Barbara? That'd be Barbara. I think so. You should go there. You should take the camera. Hello again. Matthew Donovan. going back and forth in a very short time, was refer to subsection 5083, which was the declaration of policy, which is where the basic mobility act is to employment, congestion, mitigation, and preserving of air quality, economic development objectives. Um, those are set already in policy in subsection 5083. And what I really want to do is just reference those. So if, for example, the state's goals change for public transit, we would need to change the funding piece. We would just change the policy. But right now, we distribute funding in a competitive way through a competitive process to meet those goals. Um, this is sort of covered by including congestion mitigation to preserve air quality, um, but we do have any. Um, problem with adding something about um, greenhouse gas emissions reductions? Uh, I guess my suggestion, if you were looking for me, um, would be to add that in the uh, objectives. The goals. 508. 508. Because yeah. that in number three, and actually I printed some out if you'd like to see them. Um. Yeah, and I know you guys hate paper, but they do have more. I, I was thinking the same thing, uh, uh, and I was thinking it should go in that criteria. So, uh, Anthea, can we see? Where's Can we see the uh, five hundred eight thing? Uh, um, <coughs> so, uh, I think that's the one thing I will point out is the lead in language does have to implement the public transportation policy goal set for in section five hundred eight three. So you're already saying. Yeah. The funding is good. And then I'm going to pull up and find a way to break it. That's where I wanted to see what it says. This is It could 
be added to um, number three. Yeah. And not even separate.
use 10% of the state of the money to go to the elderly. We would actually reduce the amount that we're paying right now for the elderly. And if, and we did it regionally too, so 10% in this area may not come anywhere near meeting the needs of the elderly, or based on population or the way it falls, all the money could go to Chicken County. And so it, <clears throat> I've used one of these before. Every 10 years when the census came out, we would rework this and we would need some help doing that. Um, it's because it's complicated depending on how the census is run, especially since we don't have all the numbers we need from the census because of the way they do it in a very rural, low population state. <clears throat> so if all of a sudden our, our population shifted from a large percentage over 60 to a large percentage under 17, we wouldn't really have the flexibility to turn around and say, we need to do something about this. And that's, that's really been my only purpose in not We've had these discussions before, right, where there were shortfalls in certain areas, and you know, uh, I think what you said is validated by prayer testimony that we've heard before this committee. And so, I think we just have to trust uh, Barbara's office to manage that. You know, we, we can't micromanage it in legislation, I don't think. And so, I think we need broad goals and not specific percentages that end up having, you know, they might work for a year, but another year, there's a lot of elderly and disabled people in one part of the state or one transit district and a lot less than somebody else. And that's what we heard before. And, uh, there had to be adjustments made. Who's better capable of doing that than you or who should we assign to do that other than you? Makes sense to me. If we use a formula like we did, and you can, I mean, there's a lot of kinds of formulas. There can be geographic formulas and all kinds. You have to justify to the Federal Transit Administration why you're giving them out that way instead of a competitive program. They prefer competitive programs. Some states take competitive to a different level than we do. New York, for example, sort of throws the elderly and disabled money out there. And the vehicle money for elderly and disabled. And anybody can apply for it. So one group might get a vehicle one year and not get another one for 20 years. And it's not a really coordinated system. I, I like the way we do it in Vermont better. Um, and we also don't have to justify. The, the other thing about a competitive program is if we did it by formula and we had a <clears throat> project for youth in one area, and it was a terrible project. I mean, it was really terrible. We would have to give them money, where somebody else would have a better project that would actually produce more results in another area. We wouldn't have the flexibility to do that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really happy to see the language that we got asked for, that just you know, having this stricken and being told it's not how we do it, yeah. left the gap where it was like, OK, but let's 
put in statute what we're doing, mm -hmm. but if we're going to start changing the goals, that's the piece that for me is a bigger conversation. So, so, so I'm good sticking with what's being offered okay. and, and being able to say this is what we've been doing for 15 years despite what statute said. And so let's say we want to be doing that, and you know, maybe in the next months or so we speak about these words. But I'm, I don't want to just on the fly here start changing that. Well, I haven't heard of any word. No, well, you guys were offering change. some words to add to this. Yeah, additions. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's changing. I don't want to do that. Oh, you're going to say, you apparently say air pollution. But it's already there. Um, all right. So why not add? I'm, that's all I'm saying is if we start changing this piece, then. No, I think often climate is left out. I don't understand that. And we know that public transportation can be a great way of using um, uh, mitigating climate issues. Um, you know, yes, yeah, so and the additions that I wanted to make, I would argue, if you don't increase ridership, at least in a lot of the uh, services, uh, you're increasing air pollution, which is already in there. You're increasing air pollution because an empty bus and if the diesel bus going down the road is polluting the air. But we'll more. have empty electric buses. And they won't be polluting Not for them. <laughs> and um, so I think, I mean, Mary's and my suggestions are consistent with what's up there. Um, and the um, they're also consistent with um, the state climate goals. And Okay, so let's have a show of hands. You can do it one at a time. Uh, show of hands for putting climate. Could I see the language before we start? Um, okay, what I'd like to say is, um, where is that? Um, the retreat. What is it? Three. 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 Um, Congestion delegation. Um, Preserve air quality and sustainability of the network um, and greenhouse gas reduction and reduction of greenhouse gas. Would you like me to spend some time with the two reps who are suggesting language you know, via email or after you adjourn and I can actually have something written up for tomorrow morning? Sure. And then as a follow-up question, do you want the language in 50915 to actually reference criteria to be considered or say that it should be consistent with the policy? And then as 5083 changes over time, the criteria that's considered for the competitive award of money would mirror that without needing to change it. I'm sorry, say that again. So you're going to make changes to 5083. Yeah. And it sounds like from what Barbara just testified to, they drew the language to be included in proposed 5091I to mirror what they're supposed to be considering under 5083. So if you reference 5083 and 5091, if in the future you add things to 5083, then they would need to take that into consideration in the awarding of money, yes. as opposed to duplicating it in some iteration yes. in 5091. So I can work with the agency on that, too. Well, we're now also talking about Title 24, so I'd like to hear some representation from Vermont League of City and Towns, et cetera, because this is um, the municipal and county government title. Then would you please do what I asked them to do yesterday to get some contact and report back to us? So get them to come in and give testimony? No. Because no. I don't know what I'm asking. You want them to ask I don't know what you want to ask them. Do you want to ask well, them something? What, you, what you're changing, and, and I don't yeah. have what you're changing yet, so I don't. Yeah, well, we'll look at that too. So maybe Anthea could just get it to Maddie, and Maddie could connect it to the Vermont League of City and Towns. I, I think it's more appropriate to do it through our committee assistant rather than us off wingmanning things. Yeah. We thought it was okay when I did that. The same person just uh, came on. 
I think I asked Maddie to make that contact. Okay. Yes. I feel like I was asking when I did. I didn't report to the community, is what she said. Okay, anything else on this? Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Do you want me to do the condemnation stuff? Um, are we ready for you guys? Yeah. What's next? And there's okay. some people in the room. Yes. Okay. So I think we can get to get into that. And we do have Rob White here as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. <laughs> the condemnation one would be the short. Okay, let's do that first. Yeah. Sorry, the work on you. real quick on this. So this is what we passed over this morning on sections 11 to 14 so um, that I could respond to Representative McCoy's questions uh, when you're actually here. <laughs> well, Greg will do that. You wanted to know what was required in terms of the reporting when the Agency of Transportation is condemning waste. So, I'm going to pull up existing statutes. So, in this same section on condemnation, we're in Title 19. Five oh six acknowledges the two different scenarios that you could have when the Agency of Transportation is trying to acquire land through condemnation. One is there's a judgment, it goes through the judicial process, and the other is the property owner is willing to, yeah. So 506A1, right at the top, says that within 15 business days of the issuance of the judgment of condemnation, so that's the one that's gonna come from the court, or of the preparation of a notice of condemnation, and I'll tell you what happens for the preparation of a notice of condemnation, the uh, agency shall record, and this is in big A, either of those documents along with the description of the property in the land records for the town. So something is being recorded, it differs depending on how it is that it's being acquired. So the uh, judgment language is in 505. It's 505C. So this is what would be included in the judgment and you'll see that it also is including a description of the property authorized to be taken. That's uh, in little C towards the top. And then for the instance where there is not a judicial proceeding, we are in 503E. And this lays out if an interested person enters into an agreement with the agency, what needs to be included in that. And then to double up, back in 506, the one we looked at originally, it still had the language about how you needed a description of the property. So we're getting a description of the property needing to be in there a couple of times. Yes. Um, and then. When you asked about plots, that's the issue that House Government Operations is taking up with the subdivision thing, but the agency is being told, and I you know Rob White's here, the agency is being told in statute, you need to record one of these two things depending on how you go. So can I do any language to offer? No, I just wanted to make sure that I don't see where this one really says that it's going to be recorded. Okay. The recording is in 506, yes. That's, so 506 is referencing those two things, the judgment, yep. which is in 505, yep. and the agreement, which is in 503. Okay. But either way, in little a1, within 15 days of either of those things happening, the agency needs to record the judgment or the agreement, and they need to include the description of the property to be taken. Okay. And I can show you what clerks are required to do if you're curious too. Okay. 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 Okay.
we were waiting on this conversation, so uh, are there any other concerns? And those are sections um, 12, 13, and 14, and 4.1, right? Yes. And I, there have not been any changes from version 3.1. Okay, I think you can check all three then. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's up there. Oh, my work is done here. <laughs> 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 appropriation because there was a price before. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, so that was in, uh, and Representative McCarthy's bill was uh, H-400 and minus four, H-471. And we had a long phone conversation the other day about how we might, um, what parts of each of ours, you know, seem to fit. And then we met with Anthea, and she did a really quick turnaround, and this is what we got. So I'll just sort of just quickly um, summarize what we've done and basically you know the beginning when you can follow but uh, and if you want Anthea to run through it in more detail but I'll just sort of do a, a quick summary and, and with Mike and so basically you know there's just the definition of what electric vehicle and plug-in hybrid electric vehicle are and then we took the legislative findings oh actually I should say this is not only a hybrid of our two bills but it's also a hybrid um, um, they've, uh, they've incorporated the governor's bill proposal as well. So it's really three three things fit together. And um, we really liked the findings of the um, in the in the uh, original transportation bill. Um, it uh, recommended an incentive program. Talked about it, transportation energy burdens being high. Talked about referring to the comprehensive energy plan, calling for 50,000 electric vehicles by 2025. 
talked about how transportation electrification targets will help the economy. Uh, how much was spent on gasoline in 2015? 830 million, most of which goes out of state. And if, if that had been comparable electric vehicles, it would have been $500 million in savings. We talked about barriers to electrification, the most prominent being upfront costs. And uh, said that a robust incentive would help to accelerate the program. So um, then uh, a little bit more specifics about the purchase and lease, that it was um, public service department with Agency of Natural Resources and BTRANS shall establish a new and used purchase and lease incentive program. The program shall structure EV incentives by income and in basically income incentives of 2,500, this is the governor's proposal, for households with 100 to 140 percent of medium household, medium household income, and additional incentives up to two times for households below that threshold. Would apply to vehicles, now this is where ours differs. Um, the, the governor's recommendation was for vehicles of 35,000, and we raised it to 40,000 based on um, some prices that we know of. Uh, for example, I think the, we said the bulk costs about $37,000. Yeah, we, we had taken some testimony in committee um, around the governor's initial proposal, which this very much is the, much of the same language. And a number of the vehicles that are coming onto the market that are you know, on the lower end of the base MSRP with higher ranges um, are just outside that 35,000 limit, and we looked at the limits of other states that have EV incentive programs, and a lot of their limits are 50,000. So we thought the 40,000 would be a compromise that would include some of those, you know, low, fully battery electric vehicles that are um, have the longer ranges, like the Bolt EV is a perfect example where it was just outside that 35,000 cap. So that's why Molly and I are suggesting the 40,000. Um, the program would run until the funds are fully obligated, be funded on a first come, first serve basis, uh, would include possibly a level two home charger if public, if the utilities are willing to, to do that, subject to utility rate design, and the utilities shall help market the program. The public service department may, may retain a consultant for marketing program development, up to $75,000 for that, and it will be evaluated annually by the public service department. Then the next section, these are all like section 20 and this is section 20C, um, legislative support. Uh, we want to make clear that we believe that um, the electric vehicles need to pay into the transportation fund. We know that gasoline, uh, we have not been meeting um, all the needs that we have with gasoline and uh, just wanted to make that clear, consistent with the joint filing of agency of of ETRANS, Agency of Natural Resources, and the Department of Public Service with the PUC on January 9th. They um, said that a mechanism should be charged to owners of the per kilowatt hour fee for EV charging and be phased in over time as adoption increases. So what point that would be, it's not specified. Can I ask just a clarification question? So the highlighted piece, what is that signifying versus is that what you changed? Yeah, that's right. You all covered that. Okay. Mod's just talking about the, the top piece right now. Okay, but that you did change from the original. So in general, the highlighting is a change from either any of the three that Representative McCarthy and Burke pulled from. Okay. So the legislative support section that Representative Burke was just talking about is in, in 471 in her bill. It was not in Section 20 of the T bill proposal okay. from the governor. Thank you. Uh, and then this is this is still um, part of that. The Department of Public Service is in Section 20D. In consultation with AOT and the Joint Fiscal Office, shall complete a study and issue report to the Transportation Committees before November 1st, 2019, regarding steps to implement a per kilowatt hour electric utility transportation fee, fees based on vehicle charging, along with the feasibility of using incremental. Revenue. Oh, this is your section. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Like, this is what happens when no. you work a hybrid. Yeah, okay. Um, this, is, this is for Mike to talk about. So H400, which was the bill that I got up on the wall, um, was basically the governor's program 
with the idea of implementing um, a mechanism that would acknowledge what we heard from Deputy Commissioner Allen in his testimony where there's um, the conversations going on right now about the what's the future of the implementation <laughs> of our transportation energy sector. And that when we have more EVs on the, the road where um, the utilities become much more a part of our transportation policy. Um, and what my bill initially was suggesting was that we go ahead and try to have a conversation about that. And it is very clear to everyone that this Friday, the Public Utility Commission is hosting a workshop to talk about the feasibility of um, per kilowatt hour measurement of how much EV charging is going on, um, how they'll, uh, how utilities will measure the difference between EV charging and other electricity usage. And so what we're proposing in our hybrid bill is a study um, that would allow us to have to come back and have a conversation next year with more information about the cost and feasibility of um, the utility equipment needed to actually do the metering. Um, so what is it gonna cost the utilities? What does that actually look like? Um, an understanding of the economics of this transformation that we're talking about helping to facilitate with this pilot EV incentive program. Um, and what would it take in C to, if the state were to make an investment in um, a further investment beyond this initial pilot in more electric vehicle incentives um, in the coming couple of years to, to try to get us to that comprehensive energy plan number, which we're so far away from now, um, what would be the feasibility of using the um, incremental revenue or the establishment of per kilowatt hour fees or some combination of those in partnership with the utilities to um, fund the EV incentives and the transformation to help more Vermonters get these affordable vehicles that help us accomplish our climate goals. Um, so this, this is a study um, that we're asking um, TPS and the Agency of Transportation in partnership with GFO to collaborate on to give us the information we would need to really um, help to further understand what investments if any, it would be possible, feasible, and what it would take to really move this pilot into um, something bigger for the next few years so that we can help Vermonters make this transition to more affordable and clear vehicles. Um, moving on to the next section, uh, in addition to the point of sale incentive, there is also a, a section of purchase and use tax exemption. And the tax exemption is proposed to be on the first $30,000 of the purchase price. And uh, basically, um, the language says that the tax shall not apply to the first $30,000 of the cost of an EV or a public plug-in electric hybrid. And the statutory purpose is to encourage the purpose and use of EVs and, and uh, plug-in electric. Uh, then there is a way that the uh, this should be track, track, the DMV and the tax department shall establish a way to track the number of vehicles and exemptions during calendar year 2020. So this would be for the calendar year 2020. So they would be posted on the DMV website every two weeks. And uh, this would be repealed. And also to, along with the tracking, in order to make the transportation fund whole, the uh, the cost of it was it was based on a cost of 1,500 electric vehicles at a purchase price of paying being exempted six percent on a purchase price of thirty thousand dollars came to 2.7 million dollars. So the portion of that that one million eight hundred thousand. 800900 from the general fund. So this is general fund money. We go to the T fund, and of that, up to 890, uh, sorry, in addition, $899,100 would go from the general fund to the Ed fund to make those funds whole. And it would go on a quarterly basis, 
in order to offset the loss of our vehicle sales and use tax revenue. Um, so I think all this money is proposed to come out of the money for the incentive and for the tax exemption is, is proposed to come out of the general fund. That's why we asked for the 4.5 million, or that was my thinking. Um, we know that we don't know what we're gonna get from that, from that fund, but um, that's, that's, not in our, that's not in our hands right now. So I think that uh, we have to see what, the, what, what happens there. Um, do you want to add anything? I would just say that um, we had a, a great conversation with Neil, and he's, he's done some analysis of what a purchase and use exemption would be, and we um, asked him to consider the change in consumer behavior and how the higher sticker purchase price that the purchase and use tax is being applied to on electric vehicles is before the, the tax credits that are coming on the federal side and the incentives um, that um, that might be applied here and, and also doesn't factor in the lower operating costs of an EV. So it, it could be that folks comparing a comparable internal combustion engine vehicle and an electric vehicle would be opting to pay much more than, than that base of $30,000. And so we'd still be collecting a large portion of the uh, purchase and use tax revenue for those motor vehicle purchases on EVs, um, even with an exemption on the first 30,000, so that the couple of million dollars um, that we'd be foregoing if we assumed that we were losing all of the purchase and use tax revenue from those um, EV purchases, because people would be buying ICE vehicles, doesn't really factor in the difference in price that we're trying to address with these incentive programs. So there's, it, I, I actually don't think that the impacts of uh, having a purchase and use tax exemption for EVs would be as big as um, just assuming that we're losing all the purchase and use tax revenue because we're we're trying with these incentive programs to drive consumer behavior in a different direction. How about yes. us buying a model Tesla or whatever X, hundred twenty-five thousand dollars? Why should they be exempt from the first thirty thousand? Aren't they in the position if they're buying those higher end cars? I don't know. Okay. I guess we're done. Yeah. We'll discuss this. Yeah. All this stuff. Yeah. It's, it's a great conversation to have. Yeah. I want to say also that uh, if you remember, C. Major came in here to talk about including uh, regular hybrids in our program and uh, really give that one thought and agree with her idea of isn't it even better to just get people out of, out of higher, um, you know, consuming vehicles into, into you know, better gas mileage vehicles. And it just, it just got very complicated with everything we were trying to do. And my feeling is we need to start a program somewhere. And with Mike's language and maybe possibly um, the state eventually wants up putting the Transportation Climate Initiative which would be a source of funding also. I think that this is a program that needs to go forward. If we've got a goal of 50,000 electric vehicles by 2025, we can't just do a little pilot project, whatever this is going to be, and then drop it. So I would want to include that. But we also had a conversation with Sue just after lunch, and she's pursuing um, a program in looking for other funds in other ways. So she's, she's having discussions about how to fund some kind of program for her clients at uh, Capstone Community Action. So that made me feel good that she was sort of pursuing a parallel track in order to try to get um, uh, lower mileage, um, lower gas, gasoline using user vehicles into the hands of the economy. Timmy's point, I have to agree. Um, years ago, we used to have a cap on the uh, okay. use tax, years ago, yeah. after a certain, uh, all, all cars. Uh, after a certain value or a certain tax level, and it was considered quite be aggressive. Be but, uh, yeah. And we're actually talking it's actually about actually a flat tax, which is not terribly progressive in the first place. So we're actually kind of talking about the reverse of that, of saying if you're if you're purchasing the less expensive vehicle, the the proportional meaningfulness of that is much bigger. Um, but I think the policy goal that Representative Burke and I have in mind here 
is trying to drive consumer behavior to meet our comprehensive energy plan goals and to electrify our transportation energy sector. And so there's the two pieces, the incentive piece where we're actually giving people some money off is income sensitized. Like I wouldn't qualify under these parameters and I don't consider myself a very rich person, but I don't, I make too much money to get that cash point of sale incentive as this is structured. Um, but the, um, to, to just rebut uh, Representative Corcoran's uh, comment, the comparable ICE vehicle to the you know, 120,000, the internal combustion engine, your regular gas powered car, um, the comparable gas powered car um, to the $120,000 Tesla really is like a $60,000 I don't know, Cadillac, or, you know, it's it, it's such a big gap because of the batteries that go in there, is that's what's driving the difference in price, and what we're well, trying to... Well, shouldn't be given an exemption. I mean, if they can afford it, they can afford it. So, maybe something we should consider then is applying that same MSRP cap yeah. um, to the... To the yeah, we scraped and yeah. discussed that. They get, we got bogged down there, they think. Yeah, but that's... I think that's a yeah. discussion that's worth having for sure. So, Molly, the, um, the only change I noted from the other proposal is raising the cap. But um, could you tell us what, what our. I don't know, uh, well, the other changes, change is the, the purchase and use exemption. Okay, purchase and use. So, there's a purchase and use exemption. And uh, initially, there were numbers. There was a, like a 15, for 1,500 vehicles, and there was a number of. Um, of a two, initially, my, my proposal had $2,000 point of sale incentive for 1,000 vehicles. And we decided to go with the governor's higher number of 2,500 for, and, and it was going to be, um, you, you, you were going to qualify by the fact that you had an EBT card or you, know, you received some kind of state services like three squares or heat subsidy or whatever. But we decided to go with the 2,500 point of sale incentive uh, for 100% and above, and to about 240% of median household income, and up to twice that amount of incentive for lower than 100%, because that captured more lower income people. That sounds like the administration's proposal. Right, so Molly was saying we together said, why don't we just stick with the governor's proposal and then make the tweak on the base MSRP number is really the only change we made to that. And then the other change we made was we, um, if you look at page four, um, number four, is that the program would run until the available funds are fully obligated because we know that there's some question as to uh, how yeah, much funding. Well, okay. um, and so there was a specific dollar amount on the governor's proposal. Uh, we as a committee asked for more money in our memo to House Appropriations. Yeah. And so that this language would kind of jive with all that. We, it helped us push us a little bit. In the transfer of the 1.8 is different. And that is coupled yeah. with the purchase yeah. and use incentive. Oh, that's all the same. Right. So we were we were just talking about. Okay. You know, yeah, I, I was just talking yeah. about the uh, point of sale incentive, the purchase and use exemption. It does have that? So, so I, I just want to say, I just sort of in conclusion, you know, we know that uh, there is state policy is to move towards electrification. That's part of the governor's policy. Um, we know that it can save people quite a bit of money, and I think John is going to address that issue. And. Um, we, we need to meet our, our climate goals. I mean, we need to do our part in terms of our emissions have been going up. This is one strategy that, of several, or a number that were in the Governor's Climate Action Commission report. And I think that it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's not a frivolous kind of thing. Oh, we just want to help people get into electric vehicles because they really, you know, need to drive and all that. I think it's a really serious thing that we're dealing with. And, and I feel it merits uh, moving into this policy. I'm wondering if I misunderstood the, the, I know, the I uh, purchase and use tax extension. Because um, I still have a figure, it looked like about 6% of, of $35,000 or $36,000. It's $1,800. I saw that, so I said $2,000. So $1,800 so, and, and initially it was going to be 
proposed for um, 1,500 vehicles, which came to 2.7 million. That was the cost. Okay, so you're. So I think that was what that. Is that what that that figure is? <coughs> so it's so Kathy again. Yeah. If you look at the very complicated effective date section, which <laughs> is at the very end. That's usually an easy section. <laughs> it is not an easy section here. Um, if you look at um, subsection D, which is the page 14, uh, bottom of page 13 into page 14, right. you'll see that the sales tax exemption, so that's saying that the first $30,000 right. of the vehicle are not taxed, that that will run for either two years or until 1,500 vehicles have been purchased and it's the one that comes sooner. So the tax exemption will only exist at most for 1,500 vehicles. And if you assume that every single one of those vehicles is more than $30,000, it's 1,800, so 6% of 30,000, that's lost in tax revenue taken in for each vehicle. Yeah, so I think, maybe Tim and I were thinking about this. What you're doing is you're saying, up to that number, that purchase value, there's um, no tax. No tax. After it is. Right, so if you buy a $120,000 Tesla Model X with all the bells and whistles, you would pay tax on $90,000. Yeah. yeah. You just get That's what I'm saying. No, I'm exactly right. right. I'm yeah. thinking you pay tax on all. Yeah. Okay, I should, on the other I mean, hand, they shouldn't get the $30,000. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, if you were going to buy, if, if, you, if that was going to prevent you from buying that car, you would be contributing that ninety thousand dollars, six percent of that ninety thousand dollars to the fund. I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm not averse to your suggestion of capping it, but I'm just, I'm just sort of saying, they would be paying. It, who, who knows? But for the subsidy, whether that car would be purchased. Yeah. Yeah, I still agree with you. I, 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 I'm so I think the 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 difference in the way that I look at it is not that I want to. That, that we want to um, do a giveaway to anybody who's got means, but if we have a consumer that does have means and they step up to the to the car dealership and they could buy uh, an internal combustion engine vehicle and they're going to pay purchase and use tax on a luxury SUV, that same kind of vehicle, if it has full battery capability and would qualify for this exemption, is going to cost a lot more. And we're saying it's not really like you're foregoing that revenue. Uh, by encouraging them to buy, yeah, uh, I would say that's not going to be a difficult signing factor. Yeah. If you had that money yeah. for getting sixteen or whatever the break might be, but anyway. But I think you know if you look at yeah. the, the other part of the um, the incentive part of it is meant to address you know people who are at one hundred percent or up to one hundred and forty percent of the household income. Okay, so in terms of the government differences, it would be. Raising the gap from thirty five to forty thousand dollars on the cars. Well we were just discussing the purchasing that's eighteen hundred vehicles. Uh the other changes. Yeah. Uh, things that are different. Yeah, um, so the we, we just talked about the the point of um, the that point of sale incentive that we raised the the cap on the yep. price and that is income sensitive. Um, that stops when the funds that are available for it have been fully obligated. So it doesn't have like it doesn't say 1.5 million anymore, and it doesn't have the 4.5 million that was in my bill. It says. Um, it in the um, version of the electric vehicle incentive program that was proposed by the administration, it said it would run for two years or until the. Um, Funds are fully obligated, so run run for two years from the date the PSD makes the first incentive payment available, or until the available funds are fully obligated. Um, so, since it's a bit more amorphous, how much money might be going to this program? It just says it's until the funds are fully obligated. So, let's say that you get your full ask, you get your four and a half million, and after two years, only two million dollars in incentives have been used. Under the governor's proposal, the incentive program would end at two years, even though there's still two and a half million dollars that was supposed to go to electric vehicle incentives. It's just saying the money amount drives it. It also addresses 
what Representative McCarthy is trying to do with the study of looking for ways to have the program maybe fund itself in the future where you would still have the framework. So if, for example, you got more money for this program in the next session, it could continue without needing to Does end. the governor's bill do the same thing? No, the governor's bill says it will run for two years from the date the PSD makes the first incentive payment available or until the available funds are fully obligated. And this is actually a compromise with what I proposed in my bill, which was we should figure out a way to fund the incentive until we hit that 15% of the fleet threshold of about 50,000 vehicles. So what the proposal, the hybrid proposal that we're talking about right now just says the point of sale incentive runs until the, the, those funds are fully obligated. Um, and then... Oh. I just have two more chances. I was just going to uh, basically say the, the other, you know, there's a whole section here with that study in it that's different from the others. But if you're looking at changes to what's in the T-bill currently, you're also, and this is on page three of your handout, and it's highlighted, it's being clear that it applies to both electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles as you're defining them. And as we've talked about a lot, there is no definition section on electric vehicles or plug-in hybrid electric vehicles in codified law right now. So that's something else that the handout does that the T-bill doesn't do. And it's giving it a name, the electric vehicle incentive program. We keep on calling it that. I stuck it in there. Yes. <laughs> Which is I wanted to highlight because I think it's a good ad that, that on the very first page, um, lines 5, 4 through 11 actually give that definition. And I think that's critical. And, and that is new. That is not in what 4.1 has. It was in um, Representative yeah. Burke's 471. But it's not in 4.1, which is what we're trying to do. So that's really I mean, Some of Representative Brooks, huh? Brooks, <laughs> our Burks aren't. Um, identified in the yellow. And so that's confusing, because I thought we were comparing this to 401, 4.1. So um, at the top, it says it's changes from any of the three. I certainly can redo this. No, that has. It's, it's fine. I just wanted to, that, that, that is a change, and I think it's good to keep, to, to pull that over, if, the, those definitions. If you're looking at the different components that comprise the hybrid version, um, it's drawing the incentive program and legislative findings with a few small modifications from the T-bill, the administration's version. It's drawing the study and the report from Representative McCarthy's bill, H-400, with some revisions. And then it's drawing the legislative support and the tax exemption language from Representative Burke's bill along with the definition section. So very little is new, it's just been pulled from these three different locations. Okay. So um, what is 100 to 140 percent of median household income? Depending on which data set you use, mm -hmm. it's about in the mid-50s to the mid-70,000. 100 percent. Yeah, so 100 percent is in the mid-50s. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to get at. With somebody who's earning $50,000 purchase a vehicle, which I keep going to your Chevy Volt EV, which seems to be the car that most people are purchasing in Vermont, which is a $37,000 price tag, even if we give them $2,500, will they be able to afford a car? Would they purchase that's my question. Is an incentive program that we're giving to low-income people actually going to be used because they can't afford the car anyway? Part of why this applies to used vehicles as well. So I would imagine that there are people, especially given how attractive the leases are on cars like the Bull TV, that do that are in that kind of income range that would go and can at least lease a new vehicle like that. And we took testimony before that the vast majority of folks are leasing these vehicles. But on the used side, um, you can get a bolt, uh, the, the bolt, um, or you can get, um, I've seen pricing on Nissan Leafs from a few years back, especially after there was that little 
bump up on gear with the incentive program. Some of those are coming on to the secondary use market now um, at prices that are you know, in the low teens. So I can imagine somebody who, you know, we advertise this program, we explain how much cheaper it is to drive, um, we're doing all the promotion we do with Drive Electric and the other things that we do to promote EVs anyway, going, oh man, this is a car that's like, costs one third to operate what my, my gas car does, and I can get it, you know, I'm, I'm maybe making $50,000 a year, and I can get a $2,500 or $3,000 incentive. Also, the, some federal incentives, I think, are still operating, yeah. right? For, for certain models, Plus, there's like the in hybrid electric, which has an onboard engine. Could that be a gasoline-powered onboard engine? Exactly. Okay. okay. Also, don't forget the cells are cheaper. Uh, it depends. It depends on the model. Yeah, it's a, there's a wide. The Sue Winter was here. She first she got really cheap. She said. So she was talking about. <laughs> What we do not include, so what we intentionally, after much discussion, left out, which are the fully gasoline cars that have an onboard battery, which we all refer to as hybrids. But the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle is primarily driven by an electric motor and then will often have an onboard gasoline generator that powers the electric to allow you to have extended range with the gasoline. The other thing to consider is the addition to the Incentive is the six percent forgiveness for the emergency use, which you know, stays in the Hey, how much is the home charger? Uh, I, uh, I, I might ask, so uh, that depends. Um, so you can get um, a dummy charger uh, installed. I know that we put dual ports in it at work um, where we already had the lines run out for about $350. So um, it doesn't have any kind of way to meter the, the amount of electricity. It's just a safe, the, the plug that goes into your car connected to your electricity. So um, when you, there are, they get more expensive to install and service. Um, and I believe there's a representative in the room from Fremont Power who has a pretty robust incentive program that's referenced here that might be able to speak to that. Well, I have a follow-up question. Like, uh, if we try to charge people by a kilowatt hour for, for, in order to put money into our key fund, how are we going to do that at home? some kind of metering system or something. That Talk question about that. is the hot question right now, and that's why I got off of my idea, which is in my original bill, of trying to say we really should be thinking about this incremental revenue and driving our incentive program and thinking beyond this little pilot right now to going, really we need to study this and collect more information so that we can come back next year or maybe the following year after the utilities, the Public Utility Commission, and a number of other stakeholders. They're right now, and on Friday, the Public Utility Commission has a big workshop that I believe Anthony is gonna attend to talk about that very thing. Um, and that is like the hot question is how, if, if we all agree in concept that we need to be measuring this and that that's probably the most logical way of collecting the equivalent of what we do with gas tax now on a penny per gallon basis, we don't really know what does it cost to do that for the utilities, what kind of changes in equipment and experience are going to um, be there because um, I was even speaking with a representative from one of the utilities at uh, our meeting a couple hours ago and they said, you know, at first we thought this was just going to be easy, that we could do it with the existing infrastructure we have and it turns out from a technical perspective it's a little trickier. So the language I have here on study is to help us come back next year and understand the answer to that question. You know, because I think I heard you say, or somebody over there, that 80% of the charging is going to be done at home. Right. So 
we better figure a way to <laughs> <laughs> keep the yeah. transportation fund yeah, that's how to deal with this at all. Yeah. The, uh, again, going back to the tax exemption of up to 30000 is that open-ended or are we going to sunset that? Yeah, it says after, 18, after the 1,800 vehicles. Whatever. Oh, so it's tied to the, the uh, with that 4.5, so we'll get it all it's suspended? It, well, it's, it's tied to 1,800 vehicles getting that exemption. And uh, there's a repeal section in the bill. All so right. So, would you be open to tying it to the four and a half million, and then tying it to one's income of you know what the, you know the fifty thousand? Just tying it all together. Once that program goes and the money is gone, and the tax exemption goes, and then you don't have to worry about somebody making a million bucks by a hundred thousand dollar car that's getting uh, purchased and used. Sure. Exemption. Is it fine? Yeah. Okay. I like where it's uh, Dave, uh, so we know that this, the state level for charging level one is in the outlet. That's the only area that's actually a problem. But I, I don't think it's so difficult to solve. Level two would be a dedicated circuit that could be needed. And level three, the problem there is demand charges. And you don't see utilities move to from demand charges to time of day. Because, you know, interestingly, um, you know, Barbara has suggested that you we're know, subsidizing electric cars. Now, actually, most electric cars are subsidizing the grid. They're subsidizing us. Because they charge during off peak hours. And they're paying because they don't have a time. But, well, a couple of utilities have time of day. Right? But of those that don't, they're charging the same per kilowatt hour in the middle of the night as they are during peak hours. So a person charging, they tend to charge all night, the slow charge, that you know, use the car at night and no one, and they're actually paying more per kilowatt hour for that charging than they would be if we had time to get this. Yeah, Barbara. I think that refutes what we were being told um, that Beck has a special program with her electric that she pays a very low flat compared to what she paid for what no, she was using. So I, I, I don't think that's correct. So she's well, it's a pilot. So, yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a pilot that oh, there are only about 160 folks participating in that, and there are about 3,000 vehicles. So I think the, the whole landscape and the reason I'm really driving toward us trying to get, as legislators, a real understanding of what the future is, is that there are these great innovative programs that the utilities are doing in pieces, but the vast majority of people who are charging uh, are just paying the regular yes. rates today. But there are some really, there are these chunks of incentive programs. Gotcha. And right now, BED has one, GMP has another, Vermont Electric Co-op's doing a different thing. And they're, they're all great. But if we had a statewide policy that was driving toward our goals, that was that was understandable to us as policymakers, that would be like that would be the gold standard to me. And I think right now we don't we don't quite have like the information, but we're all seeing what's coming. And I think, you know, the questions that Representative Murphy you've raised throughout this EV discussion about fairness, um, you know, are are really important questions that Representative Burke and I are trying to basically say, we know we need to have the fair payment of the use of the roads for EVs as we make this transition, and can we couple that? And so there's one, there's a comprehensive policy that all makes sense and holds together. Yeah, but let me, let me correct you. Yeah. Anyone, I don't know exactly what she's paying. I'm sorry, yeah, she and you would be very, testimony. You would be very surprised the difference yeah. between the cost of utility of off-peak power versus on peak but also you pay less when you're using it on peak um, across the, the utility is generally paying more than you are and paying less than you are um, during the off peak because it's an hourly rate that utilities pay to get the power. If it's a really hot day, um, it can really skyrocket. And most utilities don't have kind of big rates. No, they don't. I'm, 
<laughs> but I would, I would venture to say, not knowing exactly what she's playing, that uh, if she's charging at night, and you have to if you're a dealer, right? Becca? Yeah, I know I'm charging during, I can't do it, well, I'm looking for your car. I can't do it during an event. Okay. Well, and an event, event, event would be, is a high, oh, would be a high usage for a period of time. Oh, so, like in the summer when there's air conditioning. <laughs> that, potentially, or when in Hopefully the police someday we'll see. Yeah. So I can't charge during events and everything. But that, yeah, it, it's true. I, I may have muddied the waters a little bit by bringing up the specific program that I use, but um, from my understanding, the pilot program is in part to test out whether or not it is a feasible program moving forward. So I, I do think that we're going to see, as Mike really well put it, programs that do incentivize on the utility level that kind of lower cost charging um, but I, I do think we have to be really considered if we don't want it to be the concept of I'm paying less as an EV owner um, when ultimately um, the cost would be borne by the rate payers. What we're seeing is the exact opposite I think with a lot of these programs being developed. And, and I guess I want to really clarify because it's not as, I mean, fairness is always important, but as my mother told me once upon a time, as the youngest child, don't no guarantee fair. <laughs> so that's not really the part that I care the most about. It's, we're not gonna have roads to drive on if we don't figure out how to pay for the roads. And already the gas tax is not doing what we have expected in the past it to do for us. So I'm more concerned about how are we gonna pay for our infrastructure, sure. not, you know, as a collective, as people who drive vehicles, I don't care what your vehicle is. I could even that's why, why that's yeah. why that, that's why we put that section in the bill yeah. to say there's an intention to make you know a fair and we know and maybe this is an opportunity perhaps you know if we can really electrify and pay for the, the roads from the but electrification beyond that it's saying that might not be even how we fund we we need to not just eliminate other thoughts of how we might yeah, like vehicle miles traveled. Right, vehicle like miles traveled. Yeah. Or, you know, well, I, I don't think anybody's making well. any assumptions about we're going to do it this way. I think right. the intention was just to say, in the process, yeah. we want to make sure that this is not just a free ride for yeah. after vehicles. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I didn't see you sitting over there in the corner. I was looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you have any idea of how of all the people are charging electric cars now in the world? How many are on uh, a special arrangement with um, their utility and how many are just plugging in? I don't know the answer to that. Do you know the number, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> we asked Robert's office of GMP to weigh in. So we have. Wait a second. Are, are you guys finished with the first Oh, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we, we presented. <laughs> so did you want Robert to testify? Well, I think. Yeah, I guess for this and then John. Yep. It's hard sometimes to sit on the sidelines and not be able to jump in. So to answer your question, um, for all the customers, I don't have a total number of customers who have EVs in GMP territory, but I do know the 160 that are on our fixed rate. It sounds like you yeah. wanted. Uh, that was something we tried to see. Uh, if um, that would help encourage adoption of electric vehicles. Um, we've learned, um, we thought that 30 bucks pretty much would cover the cost of electricity based on the research that was done and how much juices we expected. Uh, well, people actually are, are charging more than we thought. So we'll discontinue the program and the people who are on it will live out the contract and then we'll be done with that. But the only customers that we actually know what their kilowatt hour usage is are the ones that are on that rate, and how we get that data. Um, it actually takes at three people in three different departments through very manual work. The first step is actually going out to three different sites to collect that data. I don't know what sites it's going to, but that's where it goes to get that data. It takes it, puts it into spreadsheets, which then goes to IT, who uplifts it into our billing system. It goes through kind of quality control, and then ultimately it goes to our billing department to be um, build to the customer. Uh, the three people, about eight or ten steps to actually get it there. Mm -hmm. So getting the data per kilowatt hour charge, they're the only ones we can do it on. 
because they have Wi-Fi and we have this program in place. Beyond that, we don't know who's charging, how they're charging. Level one, I was pointing out, you can plug it anywhere. Level two, though, you can have a level two installed, um, but there's no way of the utility knowing that you put in a charger, a electric vehicle charger versus a, you name the appliance, right? So there's no way of us to know that. Um, the only way we know that is by participating in a particular program that we have where we need to access that data in order to do your billing correctly. But that's 160 out of probably thousands of people who have EVs in our territory. So we have a ways to go, um, for sure. And I like your thinking, and we really do need to think more broadly, because it's going to take some time, I think, before we can actually do the kilowatt hour charge. You know, we could do it on third-party electric chargers that are out there. They are still going to be metered. So that's going to be an easy thing. Um, anyone who participates in one of the utility programs, one of the things I want to be careful of, we want to be careful of is not to penalize them in this sense and tax them because they're participating in something while others who aren't participating aren't being taxed. So there's those, those considerations as well. <coughs> right. so Robert, something I wanted to ask you that came up is that um, we uh, have heard a lot about um, and from um, Dan Dutcher, from uh, Riley Allen about uh, rate setting and kind of the conversations that are going around. You know, what's, the, what's the future look like where we've got more EVs and there's a, a lot of good news. And then at the same time, we're hearing from folks from car dealers to folks who are drive electric Vermont about how the real barrier to entry isn't the cost of the electricity. Like even at normal rates, it's still significantly less expensive. So I'm wondering, you know, if we as policymakers were to make a choice between the kind of clean sale incentive versus trying to incentivize things through rate setting after the limited experience you all have had with the pilot, you know, it seems like point of sale is where it's at. Are we are we in the right ballpark? Yeah, but there's two objectives here. So the one is how do you raise revenues for transportation power? And the other is how to get more EVs on the road. So you yeah, have the research, uh, BAC has a good report that shows that Two to one, the barrier to adoption is the price. When we got that $10,000 reduction on the LEAF, the, the, the dealership in South Burlington went from selling three a month to 40 a month, right? So it is about price. So you're definitely on the right track with providing incentives for that. I, by the way, I do like raising it to 40,000 rather than 35 because of just that the bolt. And, and I do agree in terms of low income folks you know, my father drove a Nova with broken windows in the back, and that's the best we can do. And I don't think it could be back then. It was probably a $10,000 car right now, and that was so out. So how do we make this more uh, um, 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 available to lower income? And I think opening the field to allow for plug -in hybrids and used vehicles as well, um, and, and used meaning like three years old, there's still a significant amount. That's a direction that I think we should go in. So I like that, that you're doing that. And, and GMP is also doing So all the utilities are very much engaged. And this is one of the brilliance that came out of this legislature around the renewable energy standards, right? The tier three you may have heard. So the brilliance of that is you have the electric utilities now involved in trying to solve this problem. And, in, and we're learning, right? So this is still pretty nascent, right? For all of us, we're learning. So you're going to see new rates, you're going to see new incentives coming out. So all that is presently happening. and. Probably this week you're going to hear about new things happening. Um, but I can't take the list. Um, so it's all. So and it's we're, just we on the bill. Yeah, we're, we're all in that place of trying to promote, to help the state meet its carbon reduction goals, right? That's part of the res requirement and the energy standard. But also, how do we bring in new revenues into the utilities that have been losing sales because of efficiency, because of other issues? So in order to help keep rates down, so overall the state is healthy from a rate perspective, right? So it's that balance that we're trying to achieve, and RES is there to help the utilities do that. Reduce carbon, reduce costs, promote these technologies. So we're kind of, we're all on board, and the beauty of all this is that we're all in the same direction. We have some different ideas and tangents, but overall we're, we're headed in the same path. And the new and exciting things are going to be coming out of the utilities, I'm sure others as well. And, I, and in terms of the TIVA, so I did have some suggested changes. Is that something I just, should I just give them to you and then you want me to talk about them or? 
it's a day. From whose world? Yeah, yeah, from this language or from one language? Yeah, from either the transportation in the last uh, few pages regarding um, uh, utilities and. Okay, we actually haven't made any changes from the administration's proposal yet. Okay. I, I, w I would tell you that uh, Robert and um, yeah. Margaret and Andrew Cohen, let Representative Burke and I know that um, they had made some suggestions from the by the PUC to that jurisdiction language that's in a future section. Um, and I don't think that we signed off on, on the PUC language because um, we haven't gotten that far yet in, in our T-bill. Um, so I'm wondering maybe if that's what I'm saying. If, mm -hmm. if they send that into us, if we could consider it tomorrow or Friday. OK, you want to do that? That, that sounds like it's great. Right. 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 My, my understanding was that it was um, Tweaks and the PUC was okay with it, and the PUC had sent us the original language that the administration had signed off on and tweaked anyway. So hopefully, it all everybody's on the, on board with that. So remember, everyone, that we have to have this bill out of here by Friday night. I'll send it right. I have copies of what those changes are, so I have them sent back to me, and I'm happy to come back and talk about them if you'd like. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, folks. Uh, I'm John Copans. I work uh, as the program director for the Climate Economy Model Communities Program, mouthful, uh, but more importantly for the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Uh, in light of what your chair just mentioned, which is your deadline to get the T-bill out, I'm really sensitive to your the demands that you all are under here. And so I don't want to take uh, a ton of your time, but I just, um, for the Vermont Council on Rural Development, and uh, in particular, we convene a group, a group that's called the Climate Economy Action Team. It's business leaders and organizations around the state who really see a nexus between uh, Vermont's ability to be a leader in tackling climate and Vermont's economic prosperity. In other words, what we have right now is uh, a global competition to figure out the models to build strong economies that are also carbon-free economies, right? The decoupling of economic health from how much fossil fuels we're burning. And for Vermont, I mean, this conversation that we, you were just having uh, with your utility partners about all of, we are right now a petri dish. We're a laboratory for some of these things, right? The fact that Burlington Electric Department has just unveiled a new special charging rate uh, for electric vehicles, the fact that Green Mountain Power piloted a program where you pay $30 a month as a set fee for electric vehicle charging, those are, are literally pioneering efforts, not just here in Vermont, but nationally and internationally. And what it means is that Vermont actually stands to really benefit because people see us as a leader in this space. It makes us more attractive to people moving to this state. It makes us more attractive for businesses thinking about locating in this state. And, um, and so I just, to me, that conversation highlights uh, part of what the mission of the Climate Economy Action Team is which is really to sort of leverage uh, all of the assets we have here in, as a state and to capitalize on that to grow our economy. And for Vermont Council on Rural Development, we are particularly focused on rural, rural economics, right? I mean, you all, so many of you represent small towns. And uh, to be clear, uh, what we experience in our community-based work is that our small towns are are searching for the next economic opportunity. They're struggling. They're thinking about their downtowns. They're thinking about the demographic challenges they've got. And, and what is their path uh, towards ongoing economic vitality? And why on earth am I talking about that when we're talking about electric vehicle incentives? Because we see those things as really closely married. Right? Uh, the findings that you have in that, uh, in the language actually provided by the administration does a nice job of articulating that. Some $830 million we're spending on a statewide basis uh, to basically to fill up the tanks of our cars. And here's the thing about that $830 million. A disproportionate, disproportionate amount of that money is really being paid by rural Vermonters. 
because they have to drive more to get to the grocery store, to get to school, to get to the doctor's office, and to get to work. Right? So ironically, that is the constituency that stands to benefit most financially from this move to electrification. Right? There's a, um, uh, actually I shared it, it's a handout uh, that's available. Uh, a recent uh, Union of Concerned Scientists study that looks at uh, the rural, the, the impact of vehicle electric, electrification on rural, rural Americans. And what that shows is that for, a, for somebody living in a rural area, the potential annual savings from going to an electric vehicle versus a, a gas vehicle is about $870 annual. And, and, and by the way, that assumes a, a per kilowatt hour electric rate of about 14 cents, which isn't too far off from Green Mountain Power's electric rates. But, I mean, here's the exciting thing, right? When you look at the <coughs> Burlington Electric Department program, future, B, future GMP programs, we're actually able to deliver much more competitive electric rates for sort of this, um, for any electric vehicle owner who agrees to charge at off-peak times, right? That is a really powerful part of this whole endeavor. And as, uh, as Mr. Dost has just talked about, what you see for our electric utilities is actually their kilowatt hour sales holds flat or has been diminishing. But yet they have the responsibility to maintain this massive infrastructure that we have. All of those poles and wires and substations, right? So the fewer kilowatt hours you have traveling over that means we all have to pay more for those kilowatt hours, right? Our rates go up in that circumstance. And the more that we are able to move our transportation energy needs onto that electric grid, but here's the key part of it, is to do it smartly, right? So what we don't want to do is move that electric charging onto the grid at a peak moment, because then you actually have to expand the infrastructure to support uh, that EV charging. You want to do it in a smart way so that you're training your customers and building a system such that they know they charge overnight when you're, when you're at a low demand point because there's literally no demand on our electric infrastructure. And in fact, what we're doing is we're using our electric infrastructure more efficiently, so we're spreading out those expenses across more Vermonters. So weirdly, and it's counterintuitive, that actually means somebody who doesn't own the electric vehicle actually realizes some benefit from that person who does buy an electric vehicle. And by the way, we're not even talking about the air quality benefits of, the, of, of that choice and the climate benefits of that choice. For the Vermont Council on Rural Development, this really comes down to an economic, uh, an economic calculation for the state of Vermont. How do we position ourselves as a leader within, uh, within this realm of electrification? And I, I guess, in conclusion, the, the piece that I uh, really appreciate about what uh, Representative Burke and Representative McCarthy have brought forward is that there's really two elements uh, to it, and I, I think this is important. One is really targeted to low, low and sort of middle-income Vermonters because, frankly, as you highlight, right, if you're in that $50,000 a year household income, that bull at $37,000, that's a stretch. And so, especially if you're low income, right, in that under 100%, it makes sense to do an incentive of $5,000 because maybe you're going to need that for that low income Vermonter. But at the same time, uh, we also think there is a value in having a universal tax credit or tax waiver for all new and used EV and plug-in EV purchases in the state of Vermont. And there's two reasons for that. Part of it's what we've talked about here, you all have talked about, which is the value in that point of sale incentive in changing consumer behavior. But also, I, would, I think there is real power in simplicity and a clear market signal coming from the state of Vermont. So, uh, so it, that waiver of that purchase and use tax that applies to all new and, new, new and used EV purchases to me has a real value both from a messaging standpoint so that Vermonters hear that signal from the state of Vermont, but it also has power from a branding standpoint for Vermont as we look to capitalize on this, on this economic transition. I guess the 
final point that I would make is that, um, as folks know, you know, a Agency of Co uh, Commerce and Community Development just had a grant round for EV charging infrastructure. It was using VW settlement dollars. They had $400,000 uh, that they put into that grant program. And um, they had $1.6 million worth of applications for that $400,000. And those applications came from over 45 different entities around the state of Vermont uh, applying for that money. Only nine of those were successful. I tell you that because uh, what I experience in my work is that Vermonters are actually hungry for this transition. You have Vermont communities all over the state actually hosting EV information events. Because weirdly right now, car dealers are not doing a great job of selling EVs. The best people to sell EVs are EV owners, right? So, so literally, you have communities around the state hosting events where they bring in electric vehicle owners in their cars to connect with people who are just curious about them. And that conversation, what we find is that conversation is really effective in changing people's thinking. And I, I guess uh, to leave with you with, I think by creating an incentive like this, you really give them honors another tool. Uh, to take part in a transition that what I'm sensing is they're really actually hungry to take part in. So you would have towns uh, touting that, and um, I think there is uh, some real value, I guess. So that's my, that's my very quick um, uh, explanation for, for why we're really supportive of, of these incentives and really supportive of that two-pronged approach, which is a targeted program for low-income Vermonters, but also the value of having it, the waiver of the purchase and use tax such that all EVs uh, see some some value. Yeah, um, you said nine, uh, nine EV uh, charger builders yep. uh, took 400,000. How many charging sites or individual charging outlets did those nine people? Yeah. Uh, do you know? I don't. I would say a few of those went to what are called level three chargers. And as we've talked about, the, a level three charger can almost fill up their vehicle in about 30 to 45 minutes, whereas a level two charger, it takes six to eight hours, let's say. So, uh, but level three chargers are much more expensive. So it may have been fewer units, but there's some value, particularly from a transportation corridor standpoint, in having good accessibility to those level three chargers. On the other hand, we also see real value for our, our small downtowns in having level two chargers because uh, there is a, a value in attracting people with EVs into downtowns. They, they plug in their vehicle, they do their shopping. And, and so how are these people getting paid? Were they independent people or were they government people that got the 400,000? Uh, it's a, ver anybody was eligible for that program. You know, Dan uh, can speak a little more specifically. So I think there was private entities, there was definitely public entities as well. There was institutions, towns were applicants, you know, the they're building a new parking garage in Montpelier. I think that was a candidate uh, that was successful. So it's a, it's a mix of public and private applicants. Uh, John, you mentioned uh, the value of the incentives, and uh, we heard from the auto manufacturers uh, uh, of a, uh, just a, an interesting case, which I think says a lot, state of Georgia. Are you familiar with it? I am, yeah. Okay. So, uh, by the mind of the committee, they, uh, they had an incentive of $5,000. So I don't know about, was it income sensitive to the program? Or? The, what I read is it was simply by vehicle. There was low and then no emission, and it was $2,500. It didn't matter what, what the individual thing was. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and they, when they were doing that, they were number two in the country, second in California. And then they dropped the incentive, and the sales dropped to uh, making a state about midway, about tw number 25. So do you, do you know of any others? You know, I, um, 
I, get, I I'm not one who has sort of that sense of what the, the national landscape is. A great resource on that is either Drive Electric, you've had Jennifer Wallace Broder in here from DEIC, but also NESCOM. Folks may remember Elaine O'Grady, who worked as the Air Quality and Climate Division Chief. She heads up NESCOM, which is a regional air quality. Well, she's the head of it. I think she's the head of it. Maybe, a, yeah. Michael so, O'Grady is her. They are an excellent resource on this question. They have a good sense of what other northeastern states are doing in terms of incentives. I guess the, the other piece of this, though, is uh, there are many EVs that don't necessarily go to all states in terms of what dealers are offering. And part of what dealers look at in terms of where they send those new electric vehicles is what are the incentives on the ground in those states. So uh, an example, Hyundai makes the Ionic that's really a competitive hybrid right now, uh, a very competitive plug-in hybrid, uh, the Hyundai Ionic. And it's hard to find those uh, in Vermont at this point. But it's a very, so in other words, not only does this incentive just make it more affordable, I think it also increases the number of vehicles that we see there. That might be a really good point because Georgia is not a California state owner. Uh, in terms of the ZAV, uh, I think you're probably right. I'd be surprised. So being a California state puts pressure on manufacturers and dealers to sell more electricals. That's right. And so, in fact, we are a, a member of that ZEV memorandum, and so we do have that advantage, but an incentive, a specific incentive as an addition. Well, a point might be that Georgia did well with the $5,000 without even having that question. And it's just the incentive. Well, honestly, it's not, I shouldn't say just the incentive. Um, you know, when I drop the incentive, the sales go. Right. You know, GM, I heard GMP, when, they, when GMP had that incentive for Nissan Leafs, the Nissan dealer in Vermont became the second highest uh, sales of Nissan Leafs in the country. Right? So talk about putting Vermont in the, on the map, right? Not just on the map for Nissan, right? All of a sudden that gets Nissan's attention. But it also just sort of puts Vermont yeah, on the map in terms of this um, being a leader. That was actually the percentage, I assume. Uh, I think just in raw numbers of vehicles. Really? Yep. Yeah. That's, yeah. More than a Nissan dealer in Los Angeles. I mean, sec second in the country. I see nods. I'm glad to see nods. Wow. Of the Los Angeles may have been the part of the world. It was, it was California. <laughs> All right, anything else for John? Uh, I really thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Really thank you. Really appreciate it. Phipps, I'm wondering if you if you had any response because that's the one piece that I was like, darn, I love the fact that we're putting in these income limits, but I would hate that that would limit well, people's ability to get this. I think I think the administration proposal was sort of silent on, on that. How would that would how that would be? Um, Anthea said that sometimes there are certain maybe Michelle can answer that. It does say up to $85,000 for somebody to administer the program. So that could be, you know, you could go to that person and get a stamp that you just take to your dealer, and the dealer doesn't have to address it. So, Michelle Boomhauer for the Agency of Transportation. Um, so, we're envisioning a program that would be run by an entity which has experience with administering uh, electric vehicle incentive programs. Um, I will say in Vermont, Drive Electric Vermont has administered those. I think there are other you know, entities on the national basis who are looking to break into this market um, in the Northeast and other places. And so we would have to go through a competitive process to, um, to look to obtaining um, the right uh, administrator for this program and then um, either the Agency of Transportation or Public Service Department, I think we're leaning towards the agency because the Public Service Department is um, fully extended in their staffing right now, would oversee the administrator's contract. But the day-to-day -day activities of working with the dealers and doing the income verification, et cetera, would be done through that administrator. Um, we have um, 
uh, through the, um, and turn to Dan because the acronym has gone out of my mind, the heating program that is. CEDF? Yeah, the, the CEDF, which Clean is Energy Development, Development Fund. Fund, thank you. Clean, Clean Energy Development Fund for heating type assistance, uh, weatherization assistance, um, has a model for income verification. And so I think we could um, replicate those uh, systems that are already in place, and that's what we had talked about prior to the session before we introduced this with, um, you know, trying to find out, to think about what the best way to administer uh, an income sensitivity based program would be. So uh, we have put some time into thinking those things through and um, making sure that, um, in particular, the point of sale piece will work effectively and efficiently because um, that's really where the consumer benefit is going to be found. Okay, I know you, you wanted to comment tomorrow, so I don't want to. Yeah, I mean, I think my only, I'll just say preliminarily, because there are a lot of folks that may not be back tomorrow, um, the, um, I think the work that's been done by uh, Representatives Burke and McCarthy is um, a great advancement in terms of this dialogue and, you know, trying to work through the nitty gritty details of how we would administer such a thing. Um, I also, uh, in listening to the testimony throughout the um, weeks we've been working on this, uh, you know, recognize, heard and recognized that the um, manufacturers uh, suggested real price for the value of a vehicle we would include in the program had probably been set a bit low based on the uh, technical we heard, and so the $40,000 uh, um, level, I think, is, is probably appropriate and captures just a few more models that would be helpful in the program. Um, I think that uh, we just want to go back and uh, take a look at other parts of the, the bill and, and pencil out some of the other recommendations, and uh, then we'll be prepared tomorrow to give you some additional feedback on those. Okay. So no more questions from the chair. Thank okay. you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Well, good job. Good job of paying down to things that uh, are, you know, not so far from what we've been talking about. So. Well, it's all there, you know, it's yeah. all there, yeah. except, for, except for the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's all there, except for the money, you know. A small don't... figure of three million here or there. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, we don't do the money in our bills. I guess what I mean is it was all, you know, in, in what was presented to us from the administration. The, you know, the bones of a good program that we wanted to add. Whether that will be, that's the big issue. Any other questions for these guys? All right. Thank you.